Motion carries. Comments from the public are regarding the study session agenda. Scott, are there any comments from the public? We have no virtual hands raised and no green cards turned in yet. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Let us begin with the study session. Uh, 5A, investing in the future of our learners. Thank you, President Norwood. I have with me this evening our association leaders, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves, beginning on the left with our MTA president, Diane Orlando. Hi, I'm Diana Orlando, MTA president until July 31st. <laughs> Wendy John, CBO. Suzette Bramajim, CSEA, Milpitas 281, chapter president. Sherry Ames, CSEA vice president. Good afternoon, Mary G. Dorping House, executive director of inclusive services for all learners. Preeti Jahari, Executive Director of Learning and Innovation. And Jonathan Brunson, Assistant Soup of HR, till June 30th. Thank you, team members. And we will be joined by Deanna Satan, the current president of Milpitas Management Association, momentarily. She is wrapping up some things at her school site. We'll be joined by Damon as well. Damon should be here as well, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So investing in the future of our learners is, is how we are presenting tonight's session. Uh, you'll see in the subtitle that it is MUSD Revenue Generation and Cost Management. And as I thought about this topic, I thought about how it is that in school districts, typically what happens is with the cycles of budget, the funds come in and we get sometimes one-time funds, sometimes not, and the school district, Milpitas Unified, does what it can to provide a healthy learning environment for our students. And then sometimes we begin to hit uh, recessionary times, like when 2008 to 2011, and also as we hear in the news that we're expecting a possible soft recession and also a possible decline in the amount of funds that the state will be receiving in October when tax returns present themselves. And so what we typically do is we figure out where we're going to reduce in order to stay within our budget. In Malpitas Unified, since about 2012, we've had the opportunity to use something called a strategic reserve, which is essentially a one-time fund. We've used that strategic reserve to provide full-time assistant principals, for example, at the elementary sites. We also received some one-time funds during COVID, uh, which we used to provide a health clerk at every school site, as well as increase campus monitors and supervisors for safety and security, as well as providing after school support and in school support. And so as I was thinking about preparation for this evening, I thought, why is it that as a school district, we continue to go through this cycle of having funds, using them where they uh, can augment what we're trying to do, and then having to reduce because in another five years or so, we don't have the funds again. It's this repetitive cycle that needs to be broken, and in Milpitas Unified, we've made a concerted effort since 2015 to really try and develop a revenue uh, increase uh, mindset. And so we have received a number of donations and grants through the years which have amounted to close to $20 million. This school year, for example, we've 
brought in 2.1 million of competitive grants that staff has applied for and been awarded, in addition to those grants that come from federal and state governments. So we already have this uh, commitment to trying to increase our revenue so that we can meet the needs of our students in a way that will uh, create a world-class education. And it's time that we expose to the community what the need is if we are going to continue this trajectory for a world-class education. And so that's why the title of tonight is Investing in the Future of Our Learners. I want to provide some context. We've, well, I've been talking about the fourth industrial revolution. I know Board uh, President Norwood has also talked about the fourth industrial revolution, as have other trustees and some of our community members and staff members. And I would like to just make sure everybody understands what it is and what the implications are. So this is a quick overview. The first industrial revolution was the beginning of steam power and mechanization, which led to uh, industry and factories. And around that time, the one school schoolhouse became the school that we're more familiar with, with people moving from one grade level to the next level. Why? Because in preparation for factory work. And so in other words, the education system began to mirror the industry. Then when we come to the second industrial revolution, that's where we, re we see electricity, telegraph, railway, uh, making an impact on society and people beginning to move more into cities. And so now we have the response of the system of schooling responding to people uh, coming to cities to live and to support. And so now we get to see the beginnings of having a democracy and making sure that our students in school understand what it means to be a community member. And then we come to the third industrial revolution, which happened about, began to happen in the last 50 years, and that's with the beginning of computers and the internet. And then much more recently, probably around 2010, 12, the fourth industrial revolution began. And we started talking about that with the internet of things, and now we're also looking at cyber physical systems. Internet of things is how, uh, the, through the internet and through computer systems, things can talk to each other through Wi-Fi, for example. Uh, I would venture to guess almost everybody in here has a thermostat at home that they can control with their telephone. Uh, and through COVID, I bet almost everybody in here and people looking, um, viewing our board meeting tonight possibly also had a doctor's appointment online or by Zoom. Now, when we look at uh, the cyber processes, what's happening now is it's not just the Internet of Things where it's communication over Wi-Fi in order to facilitate things that serve us. Now, it's also um, creating things that do stuff for us. For example, we see, uh, we've heard about, maybe even experienced, going to restaurants where there's not a person there to take our order. Instead, we put it into a uh, box. We've heard of grocery stores where we can go shopping without a person there to check us in and out because everything is automated as we walk in and out of the grocery store. And even much more recently in this past eight months, we heard about chat GPT. ChatGPT, like everything else, is run by artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is creating the ability for that mechanization with the Internet of Things to begin to do things that people do, such as writing articles, um, analyzing uh, legal documents. And so we're beginning to see that this fourth industrial revolution is happening even faster than we might have imagined only three years ago. 
So on this slide, I'm pointing out that uh, the fourth industrial revolution is shaping our context. And in order for us as a school district to be ready for that, now we have to continue to provide professional development for all of the learners who are within the system. That includes both those who are in the seats as well as those who are in front of them and those who surround them to create a healthy learning environment. And these are just three examples of how artificial intelligence is shaping what we, what we are doing today. So up in the top uh, picture, what we have here is the image of a map. And now with artificial intelligence, what, can, what is um, right on the horizon is the ability for not a person to uh, uh, to search through a lot of video footage in order to identify a person um, or types of trucks or vehicles, but the artificial intelligence can now do that within about a few minutes. So this is an example of how artificial intelligence is even changing the Internet of Things. In the middle picture is a picture from an organization called PRISM. And that is a educational system that allows students using um, augmented reality and virtual reality to actually experience how mathematics is applied in the real world. So it goes even beyond the manipulatives that we have in classrooms. Manipulatives are, uh, it might be blocks, it could be Legos, it could be anything that you can think of that's physical that allows a learner to get uh, physical concept of what it means to create batches of 10 um, and to also do math equations. In this case, they can do that um, virtually. And then ChatGPT is influencing what's happening in our schools and in life already. And we've had a number of conversations about ChatGPT as a district community. And I know that we have several of our teachers who are already using ChatGPT for instruction. For example, a teacher can take uh, students through an exercise on how to write a thesis statement. They write the thesis statement. The teacher can then put the thesis statement into ChatGPT, ask it to write an essay for every kid. The learner then can analyze that essay that ChatGPT produced and analyze it according to the rubric that the teacher provided and determine how they could write and um, improve upon it. So uh, ChatGPT is just one of many uh, types of programs that all use artificial intelligence to help uh, us to facilitate our work, whether it be writing essays or putting together recipes or grocery lists, whatever it might be. There are so many possibilities. And to give you an idea of how quickly this context is changing. If you were to consider Netflix, it took Netflix about 3.5 years in order to reach a million users. It took Facebook 10 months to reach a million users. And it took uh, Spotify, which I love and use every day, five months to reach a million users. It took ChatGPD five days to reach a million users. So. Even though uh, I spend time reading about the uh, automation in the fourth industrial revolution, and I haven't really done so in probably the last eight months or so, except for ChatGPT, and the reading that I did in just the last couple of days, it's just uh, very amazing at how quickly things are changing. And in order for us to be a world-class education system, we have to stay ahead and continue to be able to provide our learners with the best possible experiences so they can be shaping and leading in the future that is here. Uh, if anybody knows how to make it so that we can see my full screen, that would be great. Let me see if I can figure this out.
Tyler. <laughs> I'm trying to show it so you could see the whole thing and not just a part of it. Maybe I should share the this one. It's just that. Okay. What you're seeing there, what you're on my computer, it's full screen. Okay. All right, so I'll ignore that. Okay. Thank you for your help. And so here are some examples of ways that we as a school district are continuing to create pathways for our learners. And I'd like to point out uh, that this is one of our 17 inaugural graduating class from the MUSD Middle College High School. And this young lady is also an intern with Milpitas Beat and looks forward to uh, pursuing higher learning for journalism. So we also are looking at our world languages program and expanding that. Uh, we are expanding to seventh grade and also adding our third language. And we have dual enrollment. We have over 250 students who have participated in dual enrollment in this last semester, and we're looking to increase that. And our MUSD Innovation Campus is underway. Phase one will be open this September, and we will have Calaveras Hills High School move temporarily into the building that will eventually house the 500 students from Milpitas High School um, at what we will call the extension at the Innovation Campus, and our district office staff uh, will be moving in, as well as our adult learners into their new location. So along with this Innovation Campus comes the opportunity for us to develop more pathways. We have been working this past year with Evergreen Community College in order to create a pathway around advanced manufacturing. Advanced manufacturing is 30% of our economy here in Milpitas and offers all of our learners an opportunity for career in many aspects. When we think of advanced manufacturing, you might think of what's happening on the floor with the manufacturing itself, but there are so many other pieces that go into that. Human resources, business, engineering, software design, for example. Uh, we are also expanding our inclusion programming for learners with special education services. This year we've expanded to 11 secondary classrooms that are doing full inclusion with uh, co-teaching between both a teacher in general education as well as a specialist from special education. And we have Educate Everywhere, which continues at the secondary level for some of through 12th grade students. And this year we had about 79 students in that program. Future career skills. If you were to look at the World Economic Forum or McKinsey Report or um, the majority of any other type of organization that looks at what job skills are that are required for 2030 and beyond, you'll see that it's those job skills that uh, delve around cognitive experiences, talk cognitive skills, as well as interpersonal skills as well as the ability to uh, see things from another person's viewpoint and also to add value to what can be done 
with mechanics or what can be done with artificial intelligence. And that's a slight difference from what we might have looked at just two years ago and what the future job skills are for students because now it explicitly describes in the McKinsey report that students who are entering the job market in the next five to 10 years need to be able to um, add to whatever it is that artificial intelligence might be augmenting in the workplace. So that could be, for example, I mentioned some other areas. It can also be in photography and even in um, spheres of biomedicine. So these uh, practices and strategies that we are delving into in Milpitas Unified provide students with those opportunities to develop those skills more deeply. Cultural relevance. All that we are learning in our schools and our classrooms needs to reflect our students' ethnic backgrounds, their cultural experiences, their uh, religious experiences, as well as ancestral experiences. And cultural relevance does that. And again, it's important because since we are a global economy, in order for our learners, when they reach their future workplaces, in order for them to be successful, they're going to need to be able to work with people who have different backgrounds than they do. Inclusive learning. Just as it is important for us to recognize different backgrounds, it's also important for us to be uh, inclusive of others who have different skill sets as well as different needs. Science-based reading strategies. We are learning in recent years that the practice of uh, providing students with cues in uh, images as well as cues of other words and uh, essentially guessing at what a meaning of the word might be is not enough. Our learners also need to be able to decode reading and they need to be able to sound out individual letters and vowel sounds in order to be proficient and um, effective readers. And that is a basic skill that all of our learners need to be able to have in order to succeed in their careers. Restorative practices is a mindset around how we are with each other. And the skills provide our students similarly to social emotional learning with the ability to self-regulate their uh, thoughts, their emotions, also to be able to work through differences as well as to have deep conversations around controversial topics and topics that they're unsure of. Our signature practices are developing. We have, for example, at Senate, a large number of students who experience project-based learning across grade levels. And deeper learning is also based on project-based learning, which is something that we're focusing more on. And why is project-based learning something that will provide enhancement for future career skills? That is something I would like to ask one of the members of our association's roundtable to elaborate on. Um, restorative practices has been implemented across sites for a few years now, and I just find it to be highly transformative in how we work with our students, um, how we help them grow to be the kind of human beings that we want to set off <laughs> into the world, and especially coming back from the pandemic where our kids were separated for so long. I'm at an elementary site. Um, a lot of these skills and working with each other were not innate <laughs> yet. So when conflicts arise, we really lean on um, when harm is caused, how can we make it right? How can you be a model citizen to uphold the values of our school sites and um, be the leaders that we all know that you can be? So it's not a blame game. It's not punishment based. It's not trying to put early labels or negative experiences on our students. It's how do we engage as civic-minded, you know, citizens in our school communities and beyond? And if I could have another um, member of our association's roundtable um, highlight one of the other areas and how it relates to future career skills. It 
So I could talk about deeper learning. Um, deeper learning is the cultivation of identity, mastery, and creativity. So it's not just about taking those practical, procedural content skills and looking at them in a silo or in isolation, but really being able to then apply them to the world around you to solve problems, uh, to, sol to understand the world around you better as well. And that gets at relevance, that gets at motivation, that gets at um, our students becoming not just problem spotters, but also problem solvers, which are key skills, whether you think about an engineer, whether you think about a climate change activist, social justice, any of those areas. It's about taking, seeing a problem, figuring out the content, the skills that you need, and then um, applying so solutions and going through an iterative process, right? It's not like one idea is perfect the first time through. Um, all of our work has uh, opportunities for feedback, for revision, a pilot, then a second pilot, and then, and then you maybe move into a larger phase. Thank you, Executive Director Jahari and uh, Principal Elzi. Next, I want to take a look at our dashboard. This is from 2022. It's the latest uh, data that is available on uh, line with the California Department of Ed. Our students just completed for 2023 the assessments, which will be reflected in the dashboard probably by November or December. So I want to point out that chronic absenteeism is high. Um, our graduation rate uh, you'll see is medium. However, there was a data error in our CalPads and the, the California Department of Education, unfortunately at this time, although myself as well as others in our curriculum instruction assessment and accountability statewide committee have made it, um, have brought it to their attention that the dashboard should be um, updated when CalPads has an error that's been cleared. So our graduation rate that's reflected here is actually not correct. It reflects 89.5%, but we have a much higher um, rate than that. It's approximately 94%. So I want to delve into these data points a little bit. So let's look at the chronic absenteeism. So if we look at the chronic absenteeism, we see that 11.9% of our uh, population, or 7,100 of the students that are, I have to back up and explain that um, this is for kindergarten eighth, uh, kindergarten through grade eight of students who are absent 10% or more of the days. So that would be in a school year of 180 days. That would be about 18 days of school that they've missed at least. So then if we look here, diving down into the student groups, we see that we have a large number of our learners who have a very high absentee rate, and there are no student groups with a low absentee rate or a very low absentee rate. And so that, as you see as we go through our presentation, is an area of great concern, not only because of the academic Im impact that it has on our learners and their success, but also because of the budgetary impact that it has on our ability to provide all of our learners with the best possible learning conditions.
board member as well, the superintendent is working on that. Are there any questions that once she um, is able to, uh, to get everything back online that you may have up to this point? <clears throat> Generically or? Right now, generically. Well, I'm sorry? Right now, generically, yes. Yeah, um, so uh, back on uh, one of our earlier Hi. slides. Oh, are you back? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll wait. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, um, I just want to point out that uh, the fourth generation, I mean, the fourth industrial revolution, there, it's, it's awesome that um, you talk about technology, but I do want to point out uh, technologies also lead into things like space. There's a huge mm -hmm. boom in the space uh, arena. There's a huge boom in uh, biological science, climate change. So I don't want us to completely just focus on just those technologies uh, because uh, things in climate change is you know, tremendously impactful, especially for a lot of our kids today. Uh, things, uh, when we talk about space, who would imagine that probably within five years, there will be this concept of a space hotel. And maybe we need some people to administer the hotels up there. I don't know, but I do wanna make sure that we understand that there's a huge breadth of um, uh, changes coming into the world and they'll come at a tremendous speed. Exactly, thank you very much for sharing that other example. And I wanted to, my, the previous slide was the dashboard relating to chronic absenteeism as well as how our learners are doing and uh, academically with math and reading and English language arts. And if you delve into those other areas, you'll see that while a good majority of our students are at grade level or above, we have a number of our students who are of low social economic background or receiving special ed services or of African ancestry or Latinx. And we need to be able to focus our attention on to providing experiences that will allow them to also be uh, at grade level or above. And so some of these new mandates that came from the state and the federal government are actually opportunities for us to do just that. So if you look here at the screen, we have the different mandates that come to us. Now, digital citizenship is not actually a mandate from either the state or federal. However, it is something that's um, a high need because as we look at what's happening in the world and especially with our learners and their ability to be accountable to each other when they're using digital platforms and social media. It's an area that we need to be conscientious about in um, how we provide them with learning experiences to address this. So rather than me talking about either of any of these items, I would like to ask uh, Executive Director Dorpinghouse if you would just touch on the CSACE and how that's an opportunity for us. Sure. So our, our CSAS program, Comprehensive Early Intervention Services, I left out a C in there, uh, coordinated, thank you, um, is an opportunity for us to look at um, subgroups of populations, specifically our African American and our uh, Hispanic students who have been identified, we're over identifying them for special education, specifically in the area of specific learning disability and other health impairment or OHI. And so when we have an opportunity here to dig in more deeply, we are able to focus on those students and their particular needs and to look at what are we doing before they're identified into special education? What are those support services that we're providing as early intervening services that allow us to prevent them in, in 
as many cases as possible. If a student has a disability, they have a disability. But what we're trying to do is to, to intervene earlier so that they don't end up needing special education services. So that is the focus that we're working on and looking at our students. And we have targeted students that we're focused on to, to prevent them from needing to have those services and then looking at what are the, what's the continuum of services and what are those options of interventions that we can provide to them across the district. Thank you. And would anybody on that end like to comment on one of the other areas for opportunity? Okay. Thank you. Well, I will just wrap up with uh, pointing out that the Expanded Learning Opportunity Program provides our learners uh, with extended uh, academic-based, but also within um, music and arts and physical spaces an additional three hours after the end of the traditional school day. It also provides opportunities for intervention, direct intervention <coughs> support during the school day. And Prop 28 allows for us to use arts, music, and computer science in a way that enhances what we're already doing. So in addition to our elementary music program that we already have in place and is uh, flourishing, we are adding an arts, music, and computer science teacher on special assignments cadre, and that cadre will go to each elementary school and provide opportunity for <coughs> teachers at each grade level to engage during the school day in professional, what's called a professional learning cycle, so that that way they can uh, learn from each other what they're doing in their classrooms that's benefiting learners and using data to drive that they have those conversations and also allows them to go deeper into some of the professional learning experiences that they need in order to assure that our students are going to have those uh, work career goals that uh, skills that they need in order to lead in the next generation Superintendent, just a quick mm -hmm. question on here. I, I know it's not a mandate, but at, um, at some point, where does something like financial literacy fit within this framework? Financial literacy could fit in a number of content areas. It could fit under economics. Uh, every 12th grader needs to take an economics course uh, for a semester in order to graduate. It could also be a part of a business class. It could be a part of a math class. It um, actually is something that at the state level, legislators have proposed um, legislation around incorporating it in social studies. However, a number of educators uh, think that that might be too confining. I would like to um, broaden the scope to include some of those other content areas that I shared with you. Thank you. So innovation fuels learning. Here we have some preschoolers who are watching the groundbreaking, um, well, the early stages of phase one of our innovation campus. And I thought this was a perfect image for looking at how it is that we're trying to assure that all of our learners have a pathway to career. and innovation is what makes that happen. Now listed on the left are the different ways that our group collectively came up with um, experiences that we want to make sure that we highlight for the board as well as the community on how we are fueling innovation. And I'm going to ask Assistant Superintendent Brunson if he would speak to our employee assistance program. Thank you, Superintendent Jordan. Uh, yeah, the employee assistance program is multifaceted. When it first came up, it was about supporting the mental health, mental health of our employees and our families, and it's broadened to all of our students as well in our district. Uh, we just did a presentation on that not too long ago, um, and I'll be sending out a reminder tomorrow morning about that support. We also had a recent inquiry about housing, and we work with an association called Landed that supports uh, people, first-time home buyers to have uh, an attractive home purchase 
uh, that they secure a loan with them and then they repay later once they've developed that equity so they don't have to have all the money up front. And I know we're working with our local legislators in our city for expanded housing uh, for our employees of the school district. So I know more news is coming in that direction. And then when it comes to career pathways, working within our school district, uh, our middle college students, our adult ed program, to offer opportunities for people to grow uh, within the district into profession or levels of work that they'd like to enjoy and explore. And uh, we get to see that as we just watched our adult education graduation um, to see folks that are now going to look for employment within our district. And also, it's on here too, as our residency program that we do with uh, San Jose State, our student teachers um, come work with us. They get uh, intense training and support from our um, wonderful teachers in our school district and their support staff, and then we can hire them. And we hired all but two this year, so we're very excited about um, all of those things that we can do to increase employment opportunities, but as well as take care of our employees on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. And now I want to talk about how healthy learning environments are built. And what we have here is an image which uh, tries to portray the student and the teacher at the core with these other uh, support pieces, uh, people, positions that provide a healthy learning environment. And so if I could ask, um, President uh, Brahmajam of the Classified School Employees Association to share a bit about how some of our positions that we have up here, uh, such as instructional um, assistants and uh, custodians, campus monitors, how they contribute to a healthy learning environment. Well, <laughs> thank you, Superintendent mm -hmm. Jordan. <laughs> I would say that these positions, the classified positions, paraprofessionals, the student nutrition workers, custodians, campus monitors, and the office staff, they encounter the students, they love the students, they talk with the students, they develop relationships with the students. Uh, we hear many times how a particular student has um, related with an employee and that person has been a, a source of support or encouragement or motivation. Our employees are examples to our students of things you can do in the world to be of service to others because all of our positions are service to others. Um, so I, I think I answered your question. So Suzette, are you saying that um, when we talk about um, students being upstanders or when there's an opportunity to make sure a kid is okay, uh, the classified uh, employee um, also has a first-hand view of the child from a variety of different angles and they have the opportunity to support the students in that way as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, for instance, say, um, Say a custodian has developed a, a relationship with a child who has come up to him when he's doing something on campus and they start talking and, and they kind of know each other. And maybe that student had a really bad morning and the custodian that he adores is there and he can go talk to him and he would feel comfortable being supported and feel secure and loved. So is that a training that uh, CSEA asks for, knowing that they have that uh, relationship with students and that they're that sometimes that first line? Um, is that a training that they ask for since they know that that's something that they actively do um, so they can be you know, as good as they possibly can be? Or is that just something that we allow to happen organically? I would say it's organically. There is no specific training for that. <laughs> okay. Thank How, you. However, through um, social emotional learning training, um, executive directors of learning and development, that would be a great opportunity for our classified employees to participate in that. 
I would also say that with our paraeducators, our BITs, and our transition assistants, we do go into uh, supporting students, uh, being able to be aware of changes with them, and then also being that uh, frontline person to help support them. So there is some for some of the positions that's currently in place as well. Right, so those folks are in the classrooms that you're referring to. Right, which is a completely different construct environment and the student feels one type of way in a classroom and then outside um, around the campus, it's a, it's, a, it's a different thing. So what I also hear you saying is that the training that they get may not necessarily be the appropriate training for them because of the constructs upon which they exist. Okay. Yeah, I want to follow that up a little bit in, you know, there's, you know, the various programs such as the Sandy Hook uh, types of see, you know, see something, say something. Is that something at a level that our uh, CSCA uh, folks could take advantage of to support a particular campus that that would be, you know, beneficial? I mean, certainly the example of having uh, a, a student talk to a custodian and maybe having a real, real tough time that may signal certain things that that custodian might say, hey, you need additional help or additional, additional support, right? You bring up a good point. And I would say because a lot of the student relationship between student and staff is organic except for in the case like with paraprofessionals, BITs, et cetera, um, that would actually, I, I, okay, I'm just thinking, that would actually be a really beneficial thing for everybody in this district to be able to maybe pick up on some of those signs and symptoms of, hey, maybe this is just a little bit more than I didn't get breakfast today kind of thing. That's exactly right. So thank you for that because, and, you, and just to go back to the question that I asked, the question that I asked was, is this something that CSCA asks for, right? Not that, because if that idea would have come from the district or the board, now it's like we're saying there's one more thing that we think you should do versus the activities that you guys are aware of that you want to be good at because I know how important that janitor is uh, that secretary is and all those other things. So I'm hoping that that CSEA um, has the opportunity to reflect on some of the things that it does really, really well and be able to continue to grow them on behalf of the district and the kids because it does take a true village. Mm -hmm. We have not specifically asked in the past. Thank you. Food for thought. Thank you. Thank I you. appreciate that. Thank you. And President Orlando, is there a support a position up here that you would like to point out or comment on as far as how it demonstrates a healthy learning environment? That demonstrates what? I'm sorry, I'm oh. <laughs> as far as how it helps us to build healthy learning environments. Obviously, students and teachers and principals create a, an environment as well as our secretaries um, and support staff. I don't think you really can point out any of them, to be honest, and say that one of them doesn't. Um, if you have people who are confident in what they're doing, if you have people that feel valued, if you have people who are there for the right reasons, which is to work with students, I think you're going to produce a very good, healthy learning environment. Without one, there's a hole, bottom line. You make a cut to any of those, there's a hole that will be felt. So to me, they're all extremely important. Thank you. They all create a healthy learning environment. And the world is acceler accelerating as is MUSD. Down in the bottom right is a picture from our students at the starting line of the Malpelitis Elementary Olympics, which was a huge event that was put on with the support of, um, as we shared before with uh, Mr. Forstner and Ms. Kusunoki, all of our principals, all of our PE paraprofessionals, all of our assistant principals, 
and many, many volunteers, parents, caregivers, and other staff members as well. And what I have listed here are just some of the ways that uh, post-COVID, the district uh, has um, demonstrated benchmarks in accelerating forward. So take a look at those and let me know if you have any questions. You're going to hear in a few moments from our CBO, Wendy Jong, and our uh, business services team, which is sitting uh, behind us. And uh, what I have here is just a summary of how we've been able to provide uh, some of the learning experiences for our students using one-time money. I began at the beginning of the presentation that we've used our strategic reserves as one-time money to continue to fund uh, assistant principals at a full time, as well as professional development and uh, many other ways. And that strategic reserve is going to, is projected to have a zero balance by the end of 2024-25. Additionally, we have $17 million worth of grant funded positions. Those are grants that are both competitive grants that staff has uh, acquired as well as grants that come from the federal and the state levels that do still require uh, staff to provide uh, documentation that the money is being used in the way that it's uh, been specified. And then you'll see that uh, in 25-26, uh, that we were projected to expend about 10 million of our building fund. And the building fund reserve is a reserve that we, um, as a healthy learning environment, would like to keep intact. And so the reason for our presentation today is we wanna let the board and the community know that in order to do what we're doing, we need to be able to invest in um, the work that we have in place, as well as continue to invest in future uh, endeavors. This year alone, the staff has acquired $2.9 million in competitive grants. Also, um, we haven't seen it yet, but Rokana's office has let us, informed us that we should be expecting about $2.4 million from the federal government to support the innovation campus. And then you can see there on the bottom about $75.7 million worth of grants awarded through state and federal funds. And some of those grants include things such as the um, Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, the Educator Effectiveness Program, as well as uh, TK Expansion Program. In talking with our associations and all of our leadership uh, members, these are the different ways that, um, examples of different ways that we came up with that we as a district can um, put the and even more increased effort into increasing revenues. The number one is average daily attendance. Our average daily attendance has dropped down to about 75%. Pre-COVID, it was around 71%, and in 2018-19, it was 71.5%. And so our goal for 23-24 is to get it back to the 71%, because if we can get it back to 71% for 23-24, then as you'll see from Ms. Jung and her explanation of the budget for next year, that we will be able to then use that as the number for our ADA, um, and that would increase our funding by about a million and a half. Uh, we also plan to uh, increase the number of grants that we receive, and in order to do that, um, besides everybody, uh, putting on the mindset of how can I uh, increase revenue either by in-kind or even doing something like uh, donors choose and working with our PTAs. There's also the need for us to invest in uh, grant writing or, and or business partnership support. And with the um, outcome being that we will have gained uh, much more revenue with uh, person or persons doing that work. And then additionally, we need a community campaign. 
We've also thought about other ways that we can bring in uh, revenues. One is fee for service. And you can see listed there the different ways that we could take our leadership as a school district and put it into uh, opportunities for others to learn from us and charge them for it. And we can use our uh, C2C, which is colleague to colleague, that was began actually with our association leaders and former assistant superintendent of LND. And that is a perfect um, holding place. And currently in tech services, we have our teacher on special assignment, Karen Muska, who continues to keep it alive. But that's a great framework for us to do uh, conferences and also provide MUSD sponsored professional development for people in other districts. In order to maintain our world class education, MUSD requires community support. So back to the beginning, when I talked about not keeping our difficulties, our challenges uh, in house, but sharing with the community that. MUSD is uh, a huge part of our community, and our community is a huge part of MUSD. We're um, very much uh, symbiotic, and we need the community support in our community campaign efforts. And that concludes our presentation. Comments from the board. So when you say mandates, are those additional requirements or are those opportunities to restructure? They are additional requirements by the state or federal government. However, rather than just doing the bare minimum, following what it says we're supposed to do, documenting uh, that we've done what we're supposed to do, it provides us opportunity to change how we do things. For example, CSI, which is Comprehensive School Improvement, uh, Calaveras Hills High School has um, been identified for CSI by the federal government because of graduation rates and tracking uh, students after they exit there at the age of 18 and um, because within two years, they haven't necessarily gone on either to an institute of higher ed or to a career. So what the team determined to do this uh, last school year is they wanted to change the whole way that they deliver learning experiences and create learning experiences. And they're going to focus on becoming project-based as well as something called competency-based learning. And if you'd like any more detail on that, I could ask Executive Director Jahari. Otherwise, um, are there other questions? Um, specifically on that, it, it, the opportunities are there, right, as we continue to, to look at those requirements and how we expand and to make a healthy learning environment for our students in the future. Mm -hmm. um, typically, I think from a social emotional um, workforce, um, uh, perspective, a lot of times they see new requirements and they look like, you know, that's just piling on, right? But not necessarily if we're looking at opportunities to continue to, you know, integrate those best practices into the existing day. Yeah, it's really integrating the existing practices with new learning that we can augment. And then also examining practices that we might have just been doing because we've been doing it for however long because we didn't know another way of doing it. And so this allows us to do self-studies and also to see what else we don't know that we could know in order to improve. For example, Calvary Hills High School, taking the time to investigate what other alternative high schools are doing that's successful and then pulling from their experiences what they think would be the best um, way to redesign the school, and that's how they came up with doing project-based learning and competency-based um, outcomes. Thank you. Uh, Pivoting to a different question in regards to restorative justices, is our CSA, uh, CSEA members um, part of that uh, professional development or learning opportunity as far as restorative justice? 
I think at this point it varies site to site. Some of us who partner with organizations like Soul Shop make those opportunities available for CSEA members to engage in training and opportunities with kids during the day or paid opportunities after school. But as far as I know, it varies from site to site. Jonathan has a mic too. Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, so to build on what uh, Principal Elsie is saying, so far when we have offered district-wide restorative practices, uh, it has been open to both classified and certificated members. So we have had security guards and other members um, come to the training, but one consistent ask that we've also had from our principals um, and CSEA leaders is to increase those opportunities for them, especially for our employees that are nine, nine and a half month um, or just the school day, creating those opportunities after school um, or in the summer or beyond the school year just re it requires additional funding. Yeah, no, it's opportunity, right? Because students behave differently in the classroom and out of the classroom, right? And we talk about campus monitors, um, custodians, um, the student nutrition folks. They see things that happen outside the classroom that, you know, sometimes it's addressed, sometimes it's not addressed, right? But to that point, if they weren't provide restorative practice opportunities to learn and address that, you know, the, the student's not served, right? Because they don't necessarily bring that back into the classroom, and that's not observed in the classroom as well. That's exactly what it's all about, making sure our learners are served. And uh, we want to make sure that we're continuing to serve them with the way that we have been able to so that we can continue the trajectory of innovation. And that's uh, why this is a call to action for not only our staff to think about how we can increase attendance, but our parents and caregivers to um, also provide support in increasing attendance. It's a call to action for staff members to think about how we can uh, create other revenue opportunities, as well as for our community to come alongside us in creating those revenue opportunities. For example, every PTA, um, as I know that um, actually all five of you have served on a PTA, and you all uh, have seen and experienced the impact that the PTA can have in creating revenue for experiences that they want their school to have. And if we could just maximize that across the district, that would go even further. And I'm talking about even more so potentially creating a community campaign and uh, potentially asking community members to invest more in the school district uh, because the reality is, if we're not able to get to 71% um, average daily attendance next year, and we're not able to increase our uh, grants and revenue by uh, at least uh, another million, a million and a half to match the increase in the 71%, um, then is we're going 70, to... Is, is, it, is, it, is it 71%? 71% of no, eight. The, the attendance. Yeah, Ooh. average. Oh, sorry. Thank you. 91%. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand how do, how did we get from 97 to 71? <laughs> yeah, the, I, I, is she's like giving us a huge runway? Or? And I was confused. Thank you. 97%. Thank you for that catch. 97%. Or <laughs> 97.1. That's where I had the one. Okay. Uh, so. If we're not able to do that in some combination, then we're going to have to, in 24-25, make reductions in the amount of about $2.5 million so that we're not continuing to dive deeply into the building fund. And that is uh, something that we will have to submit as a report along with the um, board approved budget uh, to the county, letting them know an outline of we plan to increase our revenue, we plan to increase our average daily attendance, and if not, then we are prepared to make um, some reductions possibly for 24-25. <coughs> so again, this is a call to action to our community to support us in assuring a world-class education and assuring that the uh, traction that we've made thus far and the trajectory that we are on continues to accelerate. 
And I would like to thank each of our association's leaders for all of your support and also cabinet. Thank you, Superintendent. Mm -hmm. um, I would you'd like to give the other board members an opportunity to um, ask any questions of the group, if that's okay. Yes, I would just like to point out that we also have our um, budget study session uh, that we're coming up on. Mm -hmm. It starts at five. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Are there any additional comments from any of the board members? Not at this time. No, but thank you for the presentation. It um, got us thinking <laughs> how to raise more funds. So. Well, thank you for the vision, right? I think through the conversation, we talked about the investment into these opportunities is well worth it for our st uh, students uh, at heart, regardless of which silo that each of our groups are in. Uh, we're all in this together. Um, obviously, we're asking for more additional community support, you know, in ways that could be innovative outside of what the construct of state funding, local funding um, is available. And thank you for presenting the grants. Um, you know, those are opportunities that continue to exist, but we have to continue seeking those um, as well. And it would be very helpful if the community members um, also tell us about those opportunities because we're not in every single sector um, that is available. So thank you. You're welcome, and it's my pleasure to lead alongside the wonderful team that I have beside me as well as behind us. And I would like to turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Zhang to introduce our business services team. Well, I'm not so sure do we want to end this budget study for, I mean, study session first and then start our budget study or? Okay, yeah. so um, we ended uh, 5A. Um, there is, this is not an action item, so at this point we will move to item 5B. Okay, great, thank you. And while, um, think, while we're doing this transition, our um, mo uh, pretty much this is a full accounting and a payroll team here. And actually I would like to, to invite each of you just come to sit here and uh, <laughs> let's get closer. Oh, and I, I, oh, I understand that you're on a different classified uh, schedule and uh, it's okay. I'm not going to ask you to present uh, this. Pre come on, uh, come <laughs> but on, yeah, but come on. Yeah, 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 let's, uh, let's move. Find a, uh, find a spot and yeah. anywhere you like to sit here. Yeah, we should have. Do we have, come. Oh, good evening again, everyone board and community. I'm very proud to introduce our accounting and payroll team here uh, tonight with us. And we're going to do the budget study for our 2023-24 adoption. This adoption is truly a team effort. And our business services office runs um, all the transactions are district wide about 330 million dollars is all processed through our office. So I would like to um, have um, ask each of our staff, maybe just quickly introduce yourself and what you do. And we will start with myself. Again, Wendy Zhang, I'm your CBO. Naomi Agraz, Executive Secretary. Sherry Ames, Payroll Specialist. Bob Nasha, Accounts Receivables. Alicia Aldama, Payroll. Ernestina Dagnino, Accounts Payable. Regina Wyatt, Accounting Tech, two, oh no, three. <laughs> uh, Sherilyn Chalk, Accounting Tech, one. Yeah. Yun Dao, a, a Payroll Specialist. Chenny Yam, Director of Business Services. I'm Duke Bruce, Supervisor of Business Services. And 
we also have a couple staff that they cannot be here with us. Uh, we have our uh, bond contract manager, Kelly Ng. She has been working super hard because of the moving and the packing. So today, finally, she's still working. Oh, okay. <laughs> she's not supposed to because she's on vacation out of town. And we also have our uh, accountant, uh, Marilyn uh, Williams. She's also on vacation. She cannot be with us uh, tonight. And well, thank you. I, I just want to use this opportunity to appreciate for each of you for what you do. And despite all the challenges we have, just uh, like any other department, the staff shortage, but we made it. And we have not missed any payroll deadlines, and we have uh, survived from the uh, COVID, and our operations continue on. And besides, the business services division also includes um, main uh, MOT, maintenance, operation, and transportation. Um, I see we have our supervisor, Jesus Chiquaya, sitting in the audience. And hi, Jesus. And also tonight, our student nutrition team will do a board report. And MOT, right now, they're super busy and um, uh, assisting our summer uh, construction projects. So uh, once the summer project's done and uh, they're settling down, they will also provide a report to the board. Well, thank you, staff, for being here. And, uh, well, Wendy, before we get started, um, sure. so um, I haven't had the opportunity to meet most of you in person <coughs> because you guys are in the business. You guys are in uh, your office, and you're doing a lot of things. And, and so one of the things that um, I really recognize about your work is the fact that we don't hear about your work. We don't hear about problems. We don't hear about um, issues with vendor. We don't hear about any of that stuff. And if any of you guys have followed um, San Francisco Unified um, and their payroll situation, where it's been ongoing for them for the past year and a half plus, um, it's been, and I'm like, wow, I have never heard anything from the work that your team does. So I, I want to make sure that I'm able to take this time and say kudos uh, to the work that you guys do as a team on behalf of the Milpitas Unified School District uh, employees and all the children that it served. Um, and I'd also definitely like to open up the floor for other board members as well. No, I'd like to echo the sentiments. Um, it's nice that you uh, have, uh, Wendy, it's nice that you have your team here because I've seen the names, I've seen but I haven't seen some, you know, many of the faces. And I was thinking in the back of my mind, like, wow, they do such an amazing work behind the scene, and I don't, you know, we, we don't get to see your faces. And, you know, like the transactions, everything is very, it, it's in a very efficient office that you, you, you all ran together. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, you guys do amazing work. Well, Good thank you, Board. Yeah, go ahead. No. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for all that you do. You are the backbone for our MUSD, and I apparently am new uh, kid on the block, so I uh, often see the emails uh, coming in from uh, various departments, from uh, many of you. Now I'm able to relate to the names and the faces here. So uh, thank you so much for everything and anything that you do on a daily basis. We truly appreciate all your efforts. Kudos to you. I know you're the backbone for MUSD. Thank you for that. So I also want to um, echo the sentiments of my fellow board members. Um, I actually have a good understanding of uh, the budget as because I probably am one of a few crazy people who actually read the whole thing. Um, so I do completely understand and appreciate the complexity you guys are actually working through. There are so many different things that you have to track uh, and balance out. So I completely appreciate all of you guys' work, you guys, um, to manage a complexity without a peep. As uh, Mr. Norwood said, that's an awesome uh, indication of a great team. Yeah, you know, I didn't realize how many 
folks were on that team, right? As you went down the line, I was like, this is a super team, you know, payroll folks. And, you know, to that point, when we don't hear things, it, 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 it's because you're doing amazing work, right? But it's also at the heart of it. Every employee that works in the district works because they're passionate, but at the same time, they want to get paid, right? And so uh, <laughs> to keep a happy, you know, staff and employee is, is to make sure they're paid on time. And it, it's amazing work for the things that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. Especially for in our for our payroll, we have only two payroll analysts and a plus one benefit analyst. So three of them they work collaboratively. They can cover for each other. If one is on vacation, they're just a super efficient. And I yeah definitely. Well, thank you, thank you, team, for being here. And I know you already we already passed your regular work hours, so and uh, feel free. And if you would like to stay, definitely you are all welcome. But if you have other work or other things to catch up, oh, definitely so feel free and uh, to to exit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Oh, sorry, Van, I didn't see you here. I guess, uh, yeah, well, our Van, uh, new wing, uh, new MOT director is also oh, here oh, sitting yeah. in the audience with us. <laughs> okay, now since the To present, and we prepared a short presentation, so we can start our presentation. Before we get into it, I would like also to spend a few minutes just to walk you through our budget book. I know Robert, you're a good student, and you have already read the book, right? <laughs> Let me share my screen. So each year we prepare a book um, as part of our adoption process. You can see this year the cover page, the theme is our innovation campus. The middle picture here is the final bring, uh, blueprint. And those two pictures were taken during the phase one construction. We'll start with our board and the district admin team we have an index to help you to navigate through the book. There are a total of 11 pages under the budget narrative, starting with our district's mission, vision, and strategic goals. After that is our district's uh, profile, and we also updated a current year 2022-23 operation. We listed the estimate uh, revenue uh, summary and the estimate expenditure summary here for you. After that is the governor's 23-24 May revision summary. Starting this page five, all the way till page 11, are the assumptions that we use to develop our 23-24 district budget. We'll start with the revenue projections, and then here are the expenditures projections, and our multi-year projections summary, and the conclusion. After that, we have a um, summary of income statement. This first one is, I'll make it a little bit larger. You can see this is our current year estimate actual income statement of each fund, followed by the adoption year 23-24 income statement summary. And this is our multi-year projection summary worksheet. 
here is our enrollment and attendance history and a projection uh, based on our demographer's latest projection. After that, we have each fund listed separate here with a description of the fund along with a four-year financial statement for each fund here for you to review. So this is um, our budget book. Any questions? Okay. Now, actually, actually, I do have one question on here. Sure. Um, uh, looking at your uh, the the one on the proposed enrollment and attendance history, um, one thing I didn't quite understand is that next year we are having all uh, TK um, we have TK across all schools, right? To yes. me, um, that should imply more students coming in. So somehow I miss the fact that. We've got more students come in, but our, our ADA isn't, <laughs> okay. isn't continually going up. So what am I missing? Okay. Uh, we, we have a slide here during our pr uh, presentation later on, so we will touch oh, on okay, that. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay? Okay. Now, Wendy, when you asked um, any questions, are you talking about any questions in general on the proposed budget book? Uh, any question? What are you, what are you... Yeah, just uh, any questions so far you have um, regarding the budget book. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Or, one or, more. <laughs> Sorry, Wendy. One more. Um, one of the biggest um, uh, investments that we've made recently is into um, social emotional learning. Um, and I know that's kind of wrapped up a little bit in the LCFF, but mm -hmm. is there a way uh, to sort of pull that out or, or see how much we're spending in that particular, in those particular areas, and finding measurements to say, are we becoming more effective with our social emotional learning? Well, we have, uh, we receive a funding, uh, it's called mental health funding from the state, and mm -hmm. also a little bit from the federal government, yeah, and time. we use um, a separate account code to track the expenditures and the spending. So if you would like, and we can share that information with you. And if it's oh. the entire board is interested, then we can share that with you as well, as a separate uh, document. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it up to my colleagues, but I would like to see it. Okay. Are there any other comments regarding um, Robert's in interest in understanding how to put a value or a cost on social emotional learning across the district that's quantifiable? Sure. Um, I, I think some of the different ways in which we present on that is through our culture and climate data, right? The impact that's happening for students, also the mental health presentations that you've seen, the healthy kids surveys. Um, so in terms of quantifying it, we could look at certain personnel salaries as well as specific investments in programs. Um, but I don't think that will fully capture it because when we do this work well, it's very integrated, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually live in a silo. Right. Totally agree. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, board members. So I'll, while you guys are thinking, I'll, I'll start. Um, in, in looking, in reviewing the budget book, I made a couple of notes that I had inquiries about. And the first was um, on the the general fund revenue expenditures by category, page three. Page three. Okay. And then there's transfer in um, the seven, the four percent. Mm -hmm. Does that include um, developer fee, rental property, and pass-through type dollars? No, it doesn't. And okay. what we can, we will go over this slide later on during our presentation. Okay. Okay, so we can address that question. Okay, and then I was curious to understand, going through each of the different funds, 
um, the organizations, it, it, it appeared that um, adult ed had some cash reserve and it appeared that uh, CDC kind of runs flat. There's no like three year so how much, what would, what would potentially be the burden on the district if it had to support um, those programs if they didn't get any funding? Okay, and uh, we'll touch that because actually I have a slide of um, uh, an overview of all districts funds. So I'll address that as well later on. Hey, well, I'm, so I'm not showing off that I read the book, right? I mean, that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> well, you give me the indicator that you are also a good student and you read the book. <laughs> well, I think we all read the book and got something I'm else sure different from it. It's just the question is, how do we answer the question? Uh, so, for example, I've never heard the name Calaveras Center or formerly Menlo Equity. That's, um, that's um, the 99 year lease. Well, it's not a 99 year, it's probably 67, 67 year, 66 year lease yeah. uh, uh, property name. So then, so the, is the Calaveras Retail Center around the corner from, where's the Calaveras Retail Center? That's then? the old, um, what is, uh, the, the, old, the bakery, the old bakery? Oh, that's where the Denny's, Denny's. is, yeah, no, and big, then yeah. the, uh, the, right in the same parking lot. Uh, King Airgrove? King Egg Roll. King Egg Roll. No, yeah. not King Egg Roll. There's a little strip of uh, shops and also there's the workers' comp. Yeah, the workers' the comp. Medical they're medical facility there. In the there. Back. So, that's the, yeah. so they call that the Calaveras rent Retail Center and then behind it is the Calaveras Center. So they're all connected to kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So our two parcels are the very long one that has a Tesla and it's right next to the county's vacant land there. And then the little squarish part, which is Denny's, and then those uh, storefronts right behind it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And based on my looking at my notes, it seems like some of the questions I'm gonna have, Wendy's gonna answer during her presentation. Yeah, also feel free to interrupt us during the presentation if you have any questions. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so this is, uh, for me, I'm th treating, uh, I'm looking at like a study session, it's more like a casual conversation. Even though we have a slide just to kind of uh, drive us through, but feel free to interrupt. Okay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at Fund 120 Child Development Center programs. Um, in paragraph in the third paragraph or the second and a half paragraph, it talks about full day state preschool and child care program. It says, um, and maybe this is a question for um, L and I or L and D. Uh, it says, in addition to meeting child care needs of families in the community, a rigorous preschool program uh, helps ready children for successful inter entry into kindergarten. Um, how do we know that? Um, do we have data? on that? I am, I'm not sure if there's specific data on entry level uh, from, um, from preschool into t t TK or kindergarten. Um, however, I do, there may be a way to extract that out in terms of looking at um, our CDC programs um, do um, gather data on the students and where they are and their skills that are um, needed. Uh, so there may be some readiness data that we could extract out, but I don't have that at this time. So that, that is, so that is going to be a data ask, um, and it's continually being a data ask, but because we know students can't get ready for third grade at third grade, mm -hmm. and that's part of the why there's universal TK and all these other things so that student learning can begin earlier. So to, to have a statement here in the, the book saying that um, rigorous pre program that ready children for successful entry into kindergarten, we have no way to, to back that up, at least I understand kindergarten readiness, but on the academic side. We do have, we do have, um checklist that the teachers do for the preschool students in uh, ASQs uh, looking at their at their academic and social emotional they do uh, the DRDP which is the desired results developmental program 
profile, which is required by the state for all of our preschool programs and for our students with disabilities. So we do have some indication um, as to how students individually are performing, but to my knowledge, we haven't brought that forth to the board or publicly in terms of how students are doing uh, more globally. Okay, and then my, my last question, the next item, it says there's a school age program. It says the extended day program operates at Randall Rose and Center Elementary. That has approximately 85 students. Um, who pays for the school age program? This is a fee funded program as an after school program, just like other programs that we have. Um, but those that are run by CDC are parent funded or they're students who are um, uh, eligible, and that is the primary focus. Uh, they're eligible for um, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged program supports. So, because the school age program isn't does that doesn't that intersect somewhere with our ELOP or those types of programs as well, or is it based on individual school how these things are set up? Because this is called out here under the Child Development Center program CDC as an extended learning. And we just went into this extensive thing about ELOP and other funds. There are multiple programs for after school. After school care through CDC is one that's been in existence prior to the ELOP. Um, and um, as are other after school programs, um, it will continue to be an opportunity for students at those particular sites. Um, it is different in what is provided, is different than what is being provided through our ELOP programming. Uh -huh. Right, and also from fund, uh, the funding standing point, the ELOP funds is separate from the CDC, the Child Development Center. The Child Development Center, they receive their own state and federal funding, and that can be only used to fund the center, not on for other purpose. Got it. Just Thank okay. you. Quick question on ELOP. E mm -hmm. um, the, they, that is not a, it's a, is that more of a one-time kind of funding? No, the it, ELOP is, is uh, so far, right now we heard it's going to be at least five years. At least uh, five years, so yeah. similar kind of deal with like the key, our TK kind of the universal TK. TK. It, the, yeah. Yeah. So far, yeah, right now we're considering them as uh, ongoing funding. I see, yeah. okay. And uh, what you remember probably is the ELO. The ELO yeah, right, right. Uh, was the one-time grant yeah, uh, during right. the COVID. It yeah. was over. Okay. So what are the outcomes that we would like to achieve from today's uh, presentation? First, uh, we would like um, you all to be aware of the factors that we use to develop our projection. Each time, the factors change, our projection will change as well. Secondly, we would like you to understand our district's current financial position. Here is the district overview of the fund. And as you all know, a school district in the state of California, we all use a standardized account code structure. Mm -hmm. So for example, we all have to use a three digit, it's called a fund number, to account for each of the major program. In, we start our general fund. The general fund, we use subcode 010 to 080 to account for all the programs under general fund. General fund is our largest district operation uh, budget. Uh, this uh, budget is about 162 million. And then in November 2018, the voters of city Milpitas passed a $284 million bond. And now we have about 150 million left to spend. The building fund, we use 210 to account for building funds. So building fund, that, um, basically there are two uh, revenue income sources. One the primary one is from the redevelopment agency. We are uh, projecting about 6.5 million for this coming year. 
about 5 million will be from the redevelopment agency, and then the other 1.3 million will be from our rental income. And Chris, the, you referred the Calaveras uh, Center, that is part of the, the rental lease income. And the other programs we list, we are also uh, operating like a cafeteria, that is also our school lunch program. And this program um, has been growing during um, the COVID because the state uh, starts to offer free for all. For, even for this coming year, all breakfasts and lunches will be served for free. And this program budget now is about 5.9 million. We have our adult education. The adult education and the child development center, those two programs, their budget size actually is pretty similar. Adult ed operation budget is about 2.2 million and the child development center is about 2.1 million. But their revenue uh, is slightly different. Adult ed is, um, uh, we have a two part and if you recall at the last board meeting, um, Principal Juliana did a study session. There are two parts of the program. One is at the air side, and the other is at the correct Elmwood, the correction facility. And the correction facility funding is uh, driven by their attendance. Right. Versus the air side is uh, through the consortium. It's uh, more like a steady funding every year. So overall for adult ed, their total revenue budget for this coming year is about 1.9 million. And uh, uh, their operational um, expense is about 2.2 million. So that means we'll have to use um, a little bit their reserve to cover for their operations. But they do have a healthy reserve balance. It's about 1.6 million. So when you're looking at adult education and you're saying estimated actuals for 22, 23, I see two point three to eight. Yes, I'm talking, uh, I'm referring to 23-24 adoption. But we have, um, we have a both of their uh, information listed under the financial statement, um, under the fund 110, that's for adult education in the budget book. In the budget book. Yes. So if you, re if you look at the budget book under fund 110. Yep. Yep. And the, the last paragraph. Right, the last paragraph on the page. Yes. Yep. The, the projected expenditure, so that's their operational uh, expenditure budget for next year is about 2.2 million. And the with the estimate ending fund balance by the end of next year, 23, 24, it's about 1.6 million. Right. And, and looking at the a couple of pages in the budget book where you actually have this diagram. Mm -hmm. The question that I have is that um, where it's, it appears that their employee benefits are half a million of their budget. Which page you're looking at? It's the, um, from the first page that you just referred to. If you turn two pages, it's right after um, proposed 2023-24 budget adult education by object and mm -hmm. then the next one is yeah it's okay it says um, that the that their employee benefits are like around 500,000 is oh, I reading okay. that correctly yeah yeah okay yeah, the employee benefit because you see the object code. Yeah. Um, we use um, three thousand, um, uh, like four digit, like a thirty-one oh one that refers to stars for certificate and so on and so forth. So uh -huh. all three thousand um, are considered as the employee stat uh, benefits, and their total, the estimated um, total for this year for adult education is about five hundred thirty-seven thousand. And then the proposed budget for next year is 592000 So their budget is around 2.2, .2 and their benefit expense is 
500 and some odd. Yes, this is a, this is their statutory benefit. If you re, uh, you look at the the page, uh, the previous page, we have under the 1,000. That is their total certificate salaries, and then the 2,000 will be classified as salaries, and the plus the 3,000 will be the benefits, and then 4,000 will be books of supplies, and the 5,000 will be like all contracted services, and then with the total is 2.2 million. Thank you. Okay. And our child development center, and right now their operational budget is about 2.1 million. And this program, uh, right, they do not have a large fund balance to carry forward. And uh, based on our per, uh, current projection, by the end of next year, their fund balance um, is about 200K. So this program, um, both adult ed and child development, and also cafeteria fund, the pro they're supposed to be self-supportive. So in a way, we're trying to avoid the general fund contribution because um, at the end of the year, when we are ready to close out for the fiscal year, each program, each of these funds has to be balanced. If, they, if their revenue is short than their expenditures, then general fund will have to make a contribution. But currently right now, all the programs they're doing well, we, don't, we do not anticipate any general fund contribution to support them. Thank you. And the smallest of fund I listed here, fund 250, that is our developer fee. Since most of the developments um, have been uh, completed in the city of New Peters, so our developer fee collection is a lot less than it used to be. So this is an overview of all the district uh, operated uh, programs. Since the general fund has the largest uh, operational budget, that's what we will be focusing on t uh, tonight. So quick question, Wendy. Sure. Uh, I was wondering in the 2022-23, the general fund estimate expenditures as far as the section of the books and supplies is concerned, it was 8% and now uh, for the current year projection, I could see only 3%. Is there a reason why? Are they self-funded or just uh, like you mentioned? Which page you are looking at? Page so, 3 and so, page 8. Okay, so page 3, that is our current year estimate actual. Uh -huh. And uh, which one you're looking at, the, the revenue or the expenditure? Uh, the expenditure. Okay, the expenditure. Okay. Uh, then which one you are? And page eight, it's oh. still the expenditure again for 2023-24, the projected. The difference is mainly in carryover. Oh, so okay. in our budget, um, we, in the current year budget, we have all the carryover from prior year budgeted in book and supplies in 22-23. And in 23-24, we um, do not budget carry over yet. We will budget that at first in Yeah. All right. So, so basically our accounting, um, this is um, more like accounting uh, techniques. And during the year, we will fully budget in our program up to their maximum, uh, uh, like if there are any carryovers from previous year, mm -hmm. we will fully budget it. Uh, we assume that the program will be complete <coughs> spent, but in reality, it won't. So now in the summer, we're ready to close out the book and we will record what, whatever the actual expenditures and if there are any balance, then we will carry over them to next year. Right now, when we, are, when we are doing our adoption, we don't know how much carryover will be left from this year. And so that's why that portion is not included in the next year's expenditure budget. After we close out, we know how much it'll be carried forward, and then we will include them probably during the first interim. First interim. Yes. Yeah. Thank that's you kind of that. how the cycle works. Right, right. There yeah. was a huge discrepancy, yes. so I was trying to understand. Thank yes. you for that. Thank yes. you. Yes. Does the same apply to the election costs to the unrestricted funds? You know, obviously there's off cycles where there's no elections uh, in certain years, but there seems to be a cost in those off cycle years. Yes. Well, for this, uh, 
I think that we also, um, well, not every year we have an election cost, but this coming year, 23, 24, we don't have any election cost, and uh, it will be 24, 25. And we took it out okay. if we don't have. Gotcha. Yeah, I saw a small one on 20, uh, 2020 to 2021 actuals uh, on the unrestricted. 20, which year? 2020 to 2021. 2020, 2020 to 2021. Yeah. Do we have it? You see, if we yeah. have listed under actual, then it's a true uh, cost. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Again, yeah. Because in that year, did, uh, was that year, either if, if we have any board member election, we'll have to pay the election cost. If, and um, one year we also did the parcel tax renewal, then we also have to pay election cost. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Since our funding is uh, heavily relied on how the state revenue performs, and I, th I found out that this slide is very interesting. This is uh, from School Services a May Revision Workshop, and it listed the big three revenues in the state. About 96% of the state income comes from the big three revenues. So those are the sales tax, corporation tax, personal income tax. And this shows the history of the state revenue collections from 1980 till now, and plus the projections. The, you see the shaded areas, this indicates the US recessions, so the shaded here. And then the blue line represents the state revenue collection. And you can see the highest collection at the state level, that was um, actually 21-22 that year. It was not this year. This year is 22-23. It was um, a year before. Yeah. And that is the highest here. And um, then the 23-24 adoption is this what I pointed here, this is their adop um, adoption. Currently, Governor Newsom did not project any recession when he did the state revenue projection. So the blue line represents his projection in the May revision. That is about 190 billion. And what Department of Finance did, they modeled the big three revenues in the moderate recession scenario. And um, assume if a moderate recession hit the state, how the big three revenues will perform. And it turns out that their projection is um, the red line here. So it's about 40 billion difference. So what is my point here? Why I think this slide is very interesting. What I wanted to caution everyone that there is a possibility the state revenue will come in shorter than the governor projected right now. But there's no but? <laughs> Would it be higher than your red line though? It should be, I mean, you're, you're making a guess, right? So. Yes, yeah, <laughs> based on, well, there's a possibility maybe because the governor's projection is actually based on a 0.5% of growth mm -hmm. for, this, uh, for the next sure. year. Right. Yeah. yeah, and Department of Finance, um, uh, yeah, they modeled, they modeled in a different like, uh, uh, scenario. So moderate uh, recession is this. So, so the real question is, given that the uh, state tax income had been slid by six months, right? Yes. Six yeah. months. So we really, they really won't know until like October, November, what that's going to look like. Exactly. Right? Yes. So, so yeah. the, the real deal is that we really won't know for a good and yeah, we early October if, if if you're lucky, right? Well, also, and, uh, but the each month the cash flow comes yeah, in, sure. that could be a good indicator, right? That's a good point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on how many people file their taxes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And this is also why a healthy um, building fund helps us operate because we yeah, can't no, wait understand. until you know, October course. or November to set our budget. Yeah. So yeah. we have to set our budget based on what um, Wendy and her team are projecting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That's why you will see, uh, you know, the, the budget development and the budget adoption is not like, um, uh, like once we stopped here, it just stopped. It's an yeah, it ongoing, keeps, it's ongoing. Uh, living document. Yeah. Yeah, because every time when the state of the um, uh, revenue projection changes and we will update our budget, and, uh, but when those information probably sometimes they come in late. And we'll just have to keep an eye on it. And uh, the good indicator will be look at each month the state of revenue collection, the cash flow. Here are some of the challenges that facing school districts in California. This information is also shared by school services. By the way, if you, some of you not know, school services is a leading uh, consulting firm that supports school districts. Uh, often, uh, school district uh, in the state of California, we follow their recommendations and the guidance when we do our budgeting and the bookkeeping. The uncertainty of economy at the state level, as I just shared with you, so that's a big challenge. Declining enrollment, the overall state of California is declining. The uh, Governor Newsom uh, did a home heartless, uh, hold harmless uh, attendance uh, legislation um, in 2021. That year, we school districts we didn't need to take attendance. We just um, uh, because of the hold harmless, everyone can use their prior year 1920s attendance to claim for funding. But that is only for one year. Now it, it expires. Yep. And as Cheryl shared earlier during her presentation, the COVID one-time funds, they're done. We fully spend all our COVID funds. The compensation cost pressures, and you heard throughout the California and the school districts and the cost of living, um, is very high living in the area and uh, the salary increases and that is another challenge in facing um, most of the school district and the Milpitas is not alone. We're facing the similar challenges as well. Okay, now I would like to turn it over to our supervisor Duke and he will uh, uh, do a overview of our 23-24 general fund revenue. Um, what is, uh, this is a more like a summary review. And then and we can address, uh, Chris, your question about the transferring, since it's part of here. Okay, Duke. Okay, so, so the, um, the pie chart up there you'll be able to see is the, um, projection for next year, 22, 23, and 23, 24, general fund revenue. Our total projected revenue will be $157 million. Um, in this uh, total uh, funding, uh, it's comprised of the um, LC, uh, local control funding formula. Out of that 75% uh, over, over the pie charge, that's the big portion of the funding. And the rest are the 25% of it. Of those 25 percent, that's include the uh, federal funding, state funding, special ed, local, and all the transfer in. So to answer uh, of the question that you have transfer in, that means the, the money that's transferred in from the reserve fund to cover the, the budget. So that's why we have that um, $6.8 million to transfer in to balance the budget. Hey, so, uh, Duke, yes. quick question on the special education. Yeah. Uh, that is mainly federal dollars, is that correct? State. Or is that state? That's um, mainly state dollars. Mainly state dollars? Yes. And if I were to look at like the last five years, um, has that number been consistently at roughly 8.5 or has that increased or decreased? Uh, I would need to uh, I can answer that question. So for special ed, basically uh, the funding, um, the rate, because it's also funded based on attendance. I see. And um, uh, to the entire SELPA. And so the funding rate has been increased from year to year, at least adjusted by the COLA. However, because of the, the declining enrollment, 
because the ADA mm -hmm. right. as a SELMA also decreasing. So the, our total funding actually is, is a decline a little bit. Mm. Because um, uh, also through our SELPA, uh, the funding distribution is, to, uh, is based on average of um, ADA of each district. So for our district, it, we do not see a big hit because our ADA uh, for special ed students has been increasing. I see. Okay. okay. Is that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide, please. So as we said that, uh, in the earlier slide, that 75% 70, of uh, our revenue come from uh, local control funding formula. Uh, what you are seeing above there, those are the factors made of the total of our revenue. Uh, you can see um, of the total, uh, 2020, 2023, and 2024, our projection will be $118 million. Um, of that total revenue, the factor, if you look at the left column, you'll be able to tell those are the factors that include the average, average daily attendance, cost of living adjustment, local control, control funding formula add-on, and uh, supplemental. Those are the factors to made up the total calculation of uh, $118 million. What I'm trying to uh, emphasize here is the, uh, the revenue. If you look at the revenue uh, compared to uh, the year of 2022, 2023, and 2023, 2024, the differences in terms of our revenue would be a 6.07% of the differences. So that means that's an increase there. Uh, however, uh, some of you might question how come the COLA is so there is 8.22. If you use the current base 22, 23, uh, increase by that percentage, you might roughly going to get $120 million, not 118 But that's not the true number that how LCFF calculated. So when it's come down to the true dollar value of the increase, we're looking at 6.07, not the 8.2227, because of uh, the calculation based on the average daily attendance and the supplemental student uh, percentage. That would uh, impact the total dollar value. Okay. So the cola is really not the cola. So yeah, the, so the point um, we added the last line here is just to remind everyone that you know for this coming year the cola even though it's 8.2 percent, but our actual our new revenue is not coming does not coming at 8 percent. In reality, our new revenue is only at 6 percent. Because the reason is because we have less ADA in our funding for this coming year. That's the point here. And look at the year after, 24, 25, similar thing. The COLA right now is estimated at 3.9%. And because our ADA is, um, our current funding calculation is based at 9,600, the ADA uh, dropped a little bit. Even though you have a 3.9% of COLA, but the income increase is only about 2.1%. And then in the year of 25, 26, because our ADA is an estimated 95 more than the year before. So with a 3.29% of COLA increase, it will generate about 3.49% new revenue. That, so, this is just a way to show how the ADA, how important it, you know, is ADA in place in our funding. That's why I was asking you before in the previous uh, section, you know, we should have more kids directly for TK, and yet we're still seeing, but you know, overall, we're, we're not seeing a reflective of, of that increase, right? So yeah. I was trying to... Uh, I have the next yeah, slide. I'll you. go over that. Okay. Yes. So I think, Wendy, the 25, 20, 25, 26 year is the, the, the year that um, all fourth, four year olds are able to attend TK, the, right? The transitional TK. Yeah, and that, yeah. That, that, that's the reason for the uptake uh, in, in that year. Mm -hmm. um, and additionally, we talked about the whole harm So obviously, this year and next year, there's, there's no more hold harmless protection. 
um, is, is that's reflective here, right, with the decrease in ADA funding? Yeah, let's look at this slide. So this slide summarizes uh, the inf all the information and you guys have questions on. So let's take a look and what <coughs> we listed here, um, the actual will start from the year of 1819. That was a pre-COVID. And then this session shows our projection. By the way, the enrollment projection, this is our demographer's latest projection. Okay. To answer your question, Robert, and even we have more TK kids, but our middle school is, um, uh, students is dropping, uh, and also uh, our high school's enrollment is um, based on his projection. So overall, you see the district's enrollment. The enrollment is the number of kids. Right. Who enrolled in, at in our school. So right. you can see our trend for this coming year and the next year, and even current year, is pretty flat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, from 2021, uh, that year, we, we basically, it looks to me, we've lost like 400 kids, right? Yes. So there, yeah. there's, the, there's that significant difference I was trying to understand. And also, you know, in the year 2021, this was the year we're under shelter, uh, shelter in place, and mm. the people can do remote learning. Right. And this enrollment might not reflect the true enrollment, because mm. the kids could, they could maybe move out of the area, but they right. can still enroll because, um, you know, they can do virtual learning. Yep. Yeah. So the, the, so the first line is enrollment, is the number of kids what we either have or supposed to have. And the next line is the actual average, is the average daily attendance, ADA. ADA is different. ADA is if you have a perfect attendance during the 180 school days, you will earn one ADA. Mm -hmm. So um, then what I did, uh, quick attendance rate calculation, basically I just uh, used the ADA the, uh, divided by our enrollment. enrollment so that's yeah. how we come up with the attendance rate. Like say in 18, 19 year, it's about 97.5%. So we can do 97%. That's my point here. Yeah, and we've we've done we did it. that yeah. before. Mm -hmm. And look at the last year, 21, 22, we're still kind of in COVID. And the current year, uh, um, post COVID, 22, 23, you see our attendance rate actually dropped to 95%. And then the hold harmless was the year in 2021. That's why there is an A here, we're not required to report attendance for that year. And the governor uh, allowed the school district to use 1920 to claim for funding. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this year, the go uh, Governor Newsom also uh, did um, um, offer uh, additional like attendance relief and it allows the district to, mod to do a modified calculation for 21-22 use their uh, enrollment percentage. And, but for us, the best um, for funding to claim our funding is still to use the prior year ADA. So right now, the district has uh, three ways to claim, uh, to use ADA to calculate the, the LCF funding. The three ways are either the greater of either their current year mm -hmm. ADA or prior year all average three prior year. Right. So I want to do a quick time check, Wendy. Um, yeah. how, much, how many more slides do we have? We have on, uh, probably about seven slides. Okay. What time is now? Uh, 6.05. 6.07. Um, what time we come, we supposed? Uh, no, six o'clock. Oh, six o'clock. Okay. No. Well, we start late, right? Yeah. 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 I was. Yeah, was. It was just wanted to make sure that we can balance out the time because yeah. this okay. is very, very important. I think this is. Um, we'll spend more time explaining this. I think the rest of the slide can. Some of them can go pretty fast because they're more like a chart. And this, I, I would really like to spend some time to go over so you all understand how this thing work. And for this coming year, 23, 24, if we are doing well in our attendance rate, say if we do 97%, that will have a direct impact to 
to the 24-25 year. Because for this coming year, we already claimed the highest. We used the average three prior years ADA to calculate because this will give us about 9,770. It's about 97% already. So we're already right. capturing the highest ADA we can earn for next year. Right. In reality, if our attendance is at 97%, that will help 2425 because right now I'm using 96% to project the income for that year. So we needed to really do well for this coming year. It will have a permanent impact in our, in our two years funding. Okay. This is just another way to look at our enrollment trend. So you can see this three year pretty much 22 the current year, next two years were kind of flat. And we started to grow in 25, 26, but even look at this growth, it, we're not still, we're not even at the 14, 15 level yet. This is our general fund revenue trend from uh, 14, 15, and with the projection of the subsequent two years. And then the red line, this is our expenditure uh, trend. And then to combine those, you can see most of time, most of um, year we, we are, we're kind of um, pretty close. But look at, I want to point out that the uh, starting 23, 24, <coughs> and the subsequent two years, you can see our expenditure actually is above now revenue now. This is a truly, this is the true revenues and expenditures without any transfer in. Transfer in basically is from our reserve to balance the budget. So this is just a true picture where we are. We are deficit spending for sure. Now I would like to turn it over to Shani to quickly go over the general fund expenditure projections for 23, 24. Okay, for Next um, budget year, our total expenditure is budgeted at $162 million. And 86% um, of it goes to salary and benefits. 3% um, goes to book and supplies. 7% goes to utilities and other professional services. And the remaining 4% goes to Metro Ed and Special Ed County Program. How do you account for uh, legal um, uh, settlements and, and the cost of that in your projections? It is included in salary and benefits. So in salaries, it included the um, negotiated increase in the current year. And then under benefits, it's also included the cap increase. So um, in our system, when we project it, um, in our accounting system, it has the new 22-23 salary schedule, and it's the system will automatically generate the number for next year. And also for legal fees, so those will be under the operation, the most likely will be under the 5.9 million, under those line items. All the utilities, contract services, and the legal settlement, we cannot project because we don't know how, what the legal, normally we will budget under our legal fees. We'll just do a, a kind of like a historical trend, and then we'll adjust if we have to during the year. Gotcha, no thank you. I just wanted to, to notice that it's not included in this projected. Yeah, we but. include some, we include some, uh, Thank you, Wendy. Sorry, I jumped too fast. Um, so for the next slide, here is showing the 10 year staffing trend. So on the vertical axis is showing in FTE, full-time equivalent, and the horizontal axis is the physical year. So we started with uh, 10 year ago, 14, 15, and all the way to next budget year. Um, so in 14, 15, 15, 16, you see a sharper increase in FTE. Um, that is because our enrollment is growing. And then for the next um, six years, it's pretty steady um, increase in staffing. It's around roughly five FTEs to 15 F FTE increase in 
each year. And then you see um, also another sharp increase in 21-22 fiscal year. That is because that is the year that we, um, our students come back from um, distant learning. And um, so to, from the beginning of 21-22 school year to 22-23 school year, we have added um, 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 quite a few um, classified support staff that include increase in health clerk, campus monitors, custodians, and special ed para and teachers. And in the next budget year, we've also increased in um, 21 FTE in staffing. That is um, increased from, from um, Proposition 28 teachers and paras, and also increase in TOSA supported or funded by our ELOP funding and learning recovery emergency block grant. Wendy, next time when we do this slide, I would appreciate if we could see it relative to um, classified uh, full-time, classified part-time. Um, just in the future, I want to keep the conversation moving now because I see the staffing trend and it looks like we're jumping like really big numbers, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're all full-time uh, positions or well, is that what that's reflecting? We converted into full-time FTEs because okay. that's what our position control system does. So you say if I'm up, um, I only work four hours, that equals 0.5 FTEs. And we include that in our total FTEs. So this is our total district FTEs. Okay, so it could actually be more people than this because some folks will work less, but they, okay. Yeah, okay. the, the number of a headcount possibly will be more than that, definitely. Okay. Yes. Okay, um, any more question on the last two slides? If not, then the next one is the benefits rate. So here is showing the current year, which is 20 to 23, and the two pi year actual um, benefits rates, and also showing the next school year projected um, benefits rate, 23, 24, and the two out year. And for the next school year, um, STIR rates remain the same as uh, current school year at 19.1%. And for PERS, it continues to increase. It increased from 25.37% um, in the current year to 26.68% in the next school year. Um, for Social Security and Medicare, it remains the same all this year. And for unemployment insurance, we are uh, fortunate that next school year, uh, the rate dropped from 0.5%. 0.5% to 0.05%. And we are projecting it will remain low, which is pre-COVID rate for the out to out year. And for workers' comp, um, it has been increasing for the um, previous years. Um, in our budget, we projected 1.99% for workers' comp. We just received updated data yesterday. It will be 1.8084%, which we will update the budget when we come to the board next time. Thank you. Okay. So here's an um, uh, overview, big picture summary for our multi-year projections. And we use the latest governor's May revision and uh, we're temporarily relying on the one-time funds and to fund the positions that Cheryl touched a little bit previously. And we will use up our strategic reserve fund in the year of 24-25. And then we're relying on our building fund to balance the general fund budget in 25-26. This is our multi-year projection summary sheet. And I just wanted to uh, point out, so you will see the detailed transfer in from other funds listed here each year. 22-23 is our current year. So right now we're estimating 5.1 million from our reserve to balance the budget. 
And then this 1.4 million ongoing transfer in from building fund basically is every year we transfer the, the earnings from our rental income and interest to general fund to support a general fund operation. So this is not new. And then for the coming year, we projected 4.5 million. And I just want to point out in this 23-24 projection, we have not included any salary increases because we have not started negotiation yet. And we normally don't do that. So, and then uh, the year after, we will deplete our strategic reserve fund after the 2.9 million. And then we were going to transfer about half a million from our uh, post-retirement benefit fund to offset the retiree benefit cost. And then we need uh, about 5.5 million from building fund to balance the budget. And the year after, in 25, 26, right now we need about mm, 10.9 million from our building fund. Is, is our building fund increasing? Huh? What? Are the revenues from our building fund, is that kind of uh, flat or is that increasing over okay. projections? This is a great segue. Let's look oh, at our okay. building fund. <laughs> and uh, this is the uh, back page in our, from our summer, uh, multi-year summary sheet. And this portion lists the detail of each um, pocket in our reserve fund. This isn't the, the, the top portion is our general, like a, to support a general operations. So you can see we're pretty much done in 24, 25. And then this RDA settlement, uh, each year we spend about 700K. This was a board um, approved the plan to support our learning development, um, instructional materials, uh, supplies, and um, software. And after we spend it, um, this coming year, 23, 24, basically we have about 196,000 balance left. And then after that, general fund will have to pick up the cost. And then here, the bottom is the building fund. And right now, you see that this is the projected revenues for the next two years. We keep it flat. Even though we're, we know the, for the rental income, we have for the main list, uh, we have a, a 30 year lease and a sign with um, spring education. The COLA each year we can increase by 3.5%. Mm -hmm. And that brings in about maybe 850K. I mean, this coming year, there is. 850,000, so it will be like a 3.5% on top of that. But we keep the revenue flat because uh, the fluctuation from the redevelopment agency. That is the bulk of the revenue income passed through from the county. And we don't know how much it will go up and down from year to year. So right now we kind of keep it flat. Okay. And you see by the end of uh, 25, 26, we're currently projecting about 13 million balance in our building fund. This actually concludes our presentation. <laughs> we respect all the hard work, all the input, the candor, um, keeping us abreast of what you see and how, how you put it all together transparently. Uh, that's very much appreciated. Um, uh, thank you, Shannon and Duke, for always being here. I remember the first year we asked because Wendy always did the presentation, and we're like, when do we get to see some other people talk to us? And then <laughs> Duke came, and then now Shant. So we really appreciate the development and how far you guys are taking this work, so thank you. Are there any questions from the board at this time? Okay. There are no additional questions from the board at this time. Thank you very much. At this time, um, we have concluded our study session. I'd like, to, is there a motion to review and approve the closed session agenda? Move. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Seeing none, motion carries. Adjourn the closed session.
Resolution 2023.38, encouraging the celebration of the month of June as LGBTQ Pride Month. The board of the American First and Sue Burt. And Windsor, 16. It's versus wins actual or perceived gender, sexual orientation. Gender employees are protected from workplace discrimination. Supreme Court says, 13, 2000, United States, transgender and queer. It's greeting each other. Let them be. I feel like I, I don't.
Good evening, Mel Peters. I'm your 2023 board president, Chris Norwood. Welcome to this meeting of the Mel Peters Unified School District Board of Education. We appreciate your attendance and participation in our educational proceedings, which align with the guidelines set forth by the Ralph M. Brown Act for Open Meetings. Tune into our hybrid style board meetings online or either on Zoom or YouTube or in person inside uh, the boardroom at the Randall World Languages School. Public comments can be made while you're logged onto Zoom or if you're in person. YouTube, however, is a listen only option. If you're on, unable to do either of these, please visit our written comments webpage for instructions on how to submit your written comment. For our virtual audience, you will see the instructions for public comment on your screen. Our communication specialists will briefly go over them. For our in-person audience, please go to the podium when you're called upon. Instructions for both are listed on each agenda. There are copies available at the back table. One two-minute public comment per person is allowed for each item. Our communication specialist will take it from here. Thank you so much, uh, President Norwood. Um, so for our audience members here at Randall Elementary World Languages School, there are green speaker cards in the back. If you'd like to make a public comment at any point during the meeting, you fill those out, give them to me, and I'll relay those over to the board president. For our online audience, you must be um, logged on to Zoom uh, to uh, make a public comment online. Uh, you will see a hand icon by your name. You'll click that, that indicates your request to make a public comment. We will call on the names in the order they are received. Listen for your name and we will tell you when your audio is active. When it is your turn, you will see a timer counting down. You'll take yourself off mute and you'll have two minutes. And lastly, we just ask that the, uh, everybody please be patient. The board president will call on any public comment at the appropriate time. Members of the public may address the board on any subject that does not appear on tonight's agenda. However, provisions of the Brown Act Government Code 54954.2a and point three preclude any action. As an unagendized item, no response is required from the board or district staff and no action can be taken. However, the board may instruct the superintendent to agendize the item for a future meeting. Please note that the Brown Act Government Code Section 54954.3 prohibits members of the board in commenting or engaging in discussion during the public comment portion of the agenda, except when seeking clarification on a point made by the speaker, provide a reference to staff members for factual information, or request a staff member to report back to the board on any matter at a subsequent meeting. We do have special accommodations at our board meetings. Anyone requiring a special accommodation should contact the superintendent's office at least two business days in advance and we'll see what we can do. Our meetings are broadcast live on both Zoom and YouTube and are all recorded. All those recordings are on our website, www.musd.org. If you are using the Zoom platform, live transcription, closed captioning is available. You click on the closed captioning icon and a live transcription should appear on your screen. Lastly, if there are any um, additional documents that were added to the agenda, those are all public record and available upon request. Back to you, President Norwood. Thank you, Scott. Um, uh, closed session announcements. In closed session, the Board of Trustees unanimously approved the superintendent's recommendation for the position of a certificated manager, principal Rancho Milpitas Middle School. In closed session, the Board of Trustees unanimously approved the superintendent's recommendation for the position of a certificated manager, coordinator to EL, math, literacy, and interventions programs. Also, in closed session, the Board of Trustees unanimously approved the superintendent's recommendation for the position of a certificated manager, Principal Thomas Russell Middle School. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'm, I need a motion to approve the open session agenda. Motion. We have a motion for the open uh, session agenda. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Seeing none, motion carries. <laughs> Item 12, flag salute. All please rise. You got it? I got it. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Thank you. I knew it was summer. I knew it was, I knew it was summer, so I was like, it's okay. I was still thinking about them, though. Uh, comments from the public. Are there any public comments at this time? We do have an online hand raised. Uh, Anu Sankaran, we are going to enable your audio. Take yourself off mute, and you have two minutes to speak. Uh, hello, all. Good evening. My name is Anuradha Sankaran. Um, on behalf of the Tamil speaking students and parents in our community, I am requesting a revision of the rental price um, for the for renting the Melpitas High School premises for conducting our Tamil language classes on weekends. We strongly believe in the value of offering Tamil language classes in Melpita City itself to support our children's linguistic and cultural development. However, the current rental cost um, poses a significant financial challenge for our group. The current estimation of the cost for renting 10 classrooms for two hours for uh, 32 weeks comes around $41,000. So we kindly ask for your assistance in uh, reducing the rental price. Okay, so your uh, collaboration of a reduced rental price would enable us to establish Tamil language classes in Melpitas High School, and that would benefit our students. Um, thank you for your attention. This is the matter that I want to bring it up to the uh, board. Thank you. And we also, are there, Scott, are there any other comments online? That was our only online comment. Okay, um, I have a green uh, speaker card here, uh, Otto Lee. Supervisor, Otto Lee. Santa Clara <laughs> County Board of Supervisors, Otto Lee. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. First of all, thank you, uh, our President uh, Chris Norwood, for uh, welcoming here. Uh, my name is Otto Lee, your County Supervisor here, representing uh, District 3, which of course includes Mubitas, Sunnyvale, Alviso, and also uh, North San Jose and Berryessa area. Uh, truly an honor to be here tonight. My public comment tonight actually is more not about me or the county. It's really an honor to celebrate a very exciting award and recognize outstanding work of your very own superintendent, Cheryl Jordan. I want to thank all the educators, staff, and administrators in our public schools. You are our heroes to our families, our community. Throughout this pandemic, you did it all. And I'm really grateful to all of you and your service to our children. The Mopitas Unified School District has been truly fortunate to be led by one of the biggest heroes to our families, our own superintendent, Cheryl Jordan. And that's why she's earned the Association of California School Administrators Superintendent of the Year Award. And this is for the entire state of California, people. Yes, and Cheryl, it, it, she's a rock star. She's more than 34 years of service to the students and families of Mopitas Unified. And you can see how starting her service in the classroom as a social studies teacher continues to share her approach to care for students' needs and create spaces for all the children to learn. Her care and focus for students' health was on display clearly during the pandemic when she assembled a committee of more than 260 individuals connected and invested in Milpitas Unified to develop a hybrid model to educate everywhere to prevent COVID from further disrupting our children's learning. Therefore, it's truly an honor to join our community leaders tonight to celebrate Cheryl's service. And I would like to read a portion of the commendation, which is on its way. <laughs> Uh, well, I, it is on its way, it'll be here, <laughs> but, but ultimately, I mean, really, I, I don't want to delay your, your meeting. Uh, the, the, the award will be here, and I will make sure to deliver it to you, but I certainly just want to say, without uh, we, uh, uh, going over time, I know we're going over time, I just want to thank the Mupias Unified School Board for including me in tonight's event, and one more round of applause for our very own. Thank you, Cheryl Jordan.
he's here. I wasn't kidding. There was a. There was a. Yeah. Come on. I'm not gonna read all the words. Cheryl, superintendent, you want to say a few words? Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. This is very special and very unexpected. Uh, as I was saying to you a moment ago, it really is about all of the team, and I'm very honored. Uh, and and humbled to be able to work on your behalf and work with you. I see uh, parents and students and of course our wonderful team members in the audience and our board and cabinet. And it takes, it truly is all of us. And uh, yes, COVID was, uh, well, COVID was a very difficult, challenging uh, event for many of us in so many different ways. And uh, are, there's no way that we would have done it without the fantastic leadership of our association leaders and our department leaders and all of those who were willing to go the extra mile to serve millions of, uh, literally millions of meals, uh, going up to the Calabrese Hills to install Wi-Fi for a family of 12, Mr. Song. Uh, and just all of the work that each of our staff members did to assure that people uh, were safe. And uh, it's just one of the many examples of how together we really do make a tremendous impact. And as we strive towards a world-class education in Malpitas, it continues to take all of us. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, item 14, MUSD strategic goals. Um, we will go with the we will go um, with the board, and we'll start with you, Rob. With strategic goal number one: build a culture of we that engages parents, staff, and community partners in supporting student success. Improve communication systems for better outreach to parents, students, and staff. Develop educational pathways that allow students to apply their passion in learning for their future careers. Focus services and support systems to ensure that all students and are making social, emotional, and academic gains. Identify creative student-focused strategies to accommodate enrollment growth and ensure healthy learning environments. Um, our five strategic goals is something that um, everything that you hear us talk about, everything that we do in the district ties into one of those strategic goals. Our, our communication with parents, our communication with students, our communication with staff. Um, the opportunity to celebrate uh, our accomplishments of our students and our board members, our parent engagement, all of these things flow through the board's five strategic goals, which the superintendent is responsible for implementing through the district, through a number of different policies and practices. So these are the constant things that you're always going to hear us bring up and continue to remind ourselves 
of because we know this is what serves our students the best. And with that said, we'll move on to item 15, the superintendent's report. Thank you very much, President Arwood. I'm excited tonight we get to see uh, many of our, uh, both our team members as well as student leaders who are just shining on their pathways to career and to service to community. And I'd like to first point out the S4CA student projects that you see back there on electricity generation and other ways that we could create architecture in a way that is environmentally sound and provides for uh, new strategies and innovations such as how to clean solar panels without actually getting up on the panels and putting ourselves in peril and many other exciting um, inventions that I saw that the team did when uh, S4CA and the trades, pipe trades provided this opportunity for not only Milpitas High School students, but high school students across the county to demonstrate their prowess and ingenuity. And so I asked them, along with their uh, engineering teacher, Mr. Paul Oikue, uh, to come and share some of the ideas that they had. And so they're on display, and hopefully before our meetings you got to see them. And I'd like to invite one or two of the students to come up and share a bit about their projects. And also I'd like to point out that in the audience we have our executive director of the S4CA, which stands for Santa Clara County uh, Constructions and Trade Council. And we have um, uh, Brenda Childress there in the audience. She is one of, she's the executive director. <laughs> and it is under Executive Director Childress's direction that events such as this occur for our students to experience different uh, ways of how they might uh, take their career path to a career, uh, their educational path to a career. And then also we have in the audience Mr. Tony Miranda, who was one of the founders of the S4CA and continues to be a champion. And so I appreciate both of you being here tonight. And with that, I'd like to ask oh, Mr. Um, Miranda. For a second, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and with that, I would like to invite Mr. Okue and the students up uh, to take a bit of time to share about their projects. Good evening, everybody. Um, Mr. Okay, I'll let the students talk for themselves, too. But um, we said only two, two students. I'll take two groups of students. So my first group is going to talk about what they have for about okay. a minute and a half. Okay. Um, hello. My name is Anshika. Um, I'm part of um, the Milpitas Engineering Academy. And my project is uh, a board, so it's kind of like back there. Um, but the concept is basically a elect electricity generating bike. So as you bike, it generates electricity that powers batteries that you can put in any appliance you have in your house. And um, I kind of used what was currently existing, which was a bike that's in place. That means you can't, you know, move anywhere um, as you're biking. Oh, um, <laughs> so, so yes. Um, Um, so in the middle, that's like my official uh, design of what I wanted it to be. Um, so I wanted to really, I'm a big, you know, lover for electricity. And I thought, how can I make um, this type of electricity available to a lot of people in the world? And I thought the materials I use for this project is actually extremely cheap. The machine itself would cost around like, 40 to $50, and I'm still working to make that cheaper for people in third world countries, because if they can you know, have access to electricity without even having to, I guess, pay for your electricity bills, right, right. Um, it's really nice for all of them to gain electricity that way. Thank you. Oh, OK. Hi, my name is Ruskan. My name is Agna. Um, and our goal for our project was to combine three types of renewable energy sources into one to maximize our energy efficiency. So we know with like all of our crazy weather patterns that we've been having, we noticed that like 
we have a lot of different um, energy sources at once. Sometimes we have sun, sometimes we have wind, sometimes we have rain. So to be able to uh, use every single one of those sources, we decided to make a product that can use all three of those sources at once. And it can fuel like houses. We want to be able to uh, energize anything and we want to make it kind of like what Anshika said, we wanted to make it cheaper just so like anyone can use it and it's supposed to be able to be put anywhere from like anywhere that you want to be able to put it, that's where we want to put it. Like it's for the user and it's for them to be, it's like for their accessibility. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Okue. And okay, we have another group. One last. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is uh, Gabriel Padilla, and my idea is to, it's called the Solar Jets. And um, what it does is um, you could clean your solar panels within a flip of a, a, flip of a switch. And a uh, funny story actually, I, um, what inspired me to make this was um, uh, we have solar panels in our house and uh, I saw my dad climb, climb up on his ladder trying to clean the solar panels. And he's like, he's an old guy, he's over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that's dangerous. I don't want, I, you know, I don't want to see him hurt himself, fall down the ladder, you know, potentially shock himself. Yeah. So I came up with this idea where you press the button and it's, it's high pressure, high pressure water. It's deionized water uh, that cleans your solar panel. And uh, deionized water, it, um, it leaves no watermarks, which is convenient. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason why you also want to have your, have your solar panels clean is to um, produce maximum energy. With them dirty, you don't produce as much energy as you normally would, and that's just wasting money. So, yeah. Thank you. Good evening, MUSC board. My name is Basista, and this is my partner, Laksha, and we're here from the Engineering <coughs> and Technology Academy here at Milk Pius High School. So, we went to the S4CA competition as well, and we enter in the technology section, and this is our project that we dubbed Blind. So this is, this, our project is called, is basically solar blinds, and what it does is, you can put these solar blinds outside your windows, outside your house, and we have solar panels on the panels of, the, of your blinds, and so whenever you have your blinds open, you, the sunlight will go and hit the solar panels, and it will allow you to grab energy from the sun, and so even when, you're, um, when you close the blinds and say you want, to, you want it to be dark inside your home and you want energy to be captured, you can put these solar blinds out and it captures energy from the daylight. And so for this project, with the help of our esteemed teacher, Mr. Paul Koye, we won the Block Construction Award with a prize of $100 at S4CA. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Okoye. You are, have made such a tremendous difference since coming to Milpitas about four years ago now. You say yes to every opportunity for kids to learn and demonstrate uh, their, learning, their ideas, and I appreciate you for that. And uh, Gabriel, uh, when I saw your project at the fair, remember I talked to you about getting it patented, well, I spoke about that with Mr. Miranda and Executive uh, Director Childress in the S4CA uh, meeting that we had last week or the week before that. And they're looking into possibilities of how they might be able to support patents for uh, students such as yourselves who have ingenious ideas and your ideas are yours. <laughs> Thank you. And we. I just wanted to add to that um, strategic goal number three develop educational pathways that allow students to apply their passion in learning for their future careers. That's yes. what you guys got a chance to just witness. Yep. Thank you, President Norwood. And along the same lines, uh, building a culture of we also includes working with our community groups and the Milpitas Community Education Foundation in addition to the STEAM Showcase, also sponsors MAGIC, which is 
more active girls in computing. And they have been in the back sharing their projects that they did with those of you who took time to see them before the board meeting started. And I'd like to invite uh, their sponsor, Ms. Sheetel Park Clay, as well as a couple of the students to share about their inventions. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Ayana Fahim. I'm 14 years old and a soon-to-be high schooler at MHS. Today, I would like to talk about my experience with the Magic program and the app I created. I started off the program thinking of coding as a boring list of complicated, lengthy computer language. But now, I'm an alumni in this program and I've gone from doing basic block coding to image classification, which has completely changed my mindset on coding and applications of technology. Now I know that technology is a powerful tool to combine my interest in medicine, technology, and art to make an app to share with the world. Uh, my app is ElectroBody, which is mainly made for classifying skin lesions, which is done through taking a picture and having the computer recognize if it's a common skin condition or a deadly cancer through machine learning. I was able to make the app more well-rounded by adding a screen that involves symptom-based disease recognition and a mood log where you can journal your thoughts. Overall, this was a very transformative experience for me, and I'm so glad I got the opportunity to work with my amazing mentor, Anouk, and this wonderful program. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Nishka Gohel, and I'm a 14-year-old going to Milpitas High School next year. I am so glad I got the opportunity this year to become a member of the MAGIC organization, and I made a project. Uh, it's actually a Google website where um, children grades from four through six can visit and basically just make fun projects that relate to medical and doctor and just different like aspects of the medical field and I um, made videos uh, to guide them on making each project and each project is very special has fun facts makes it attractive for younger kids to ha experience um, how it is to help people and understand how their body functions and this this website was made because I always wanted to become a doctor and I wanted other people to understand and just have fun and have interest in helping other people and also learning new things in the field. And um, yeah, so I am so glad I joined Magic this year and for sure I will definitely recommend it to other people who have interest in STEM to joining and it's just an amazing experience. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Pondley and also MCEF and uh, students for sharing the magic that you learned in coding and creating new ideas that could possibly save lives. So thank you. Next, I would like to introduce some new members of our team who will begin their time with us on July 1st. I'll start first with Stephanie Diaz. Stephanie Diaz was a member of our team uh, about 10 years back where she worked with our students receiving special education services as a one-on-one -on -one and behavior intervention therapist. And she was very excited about this experience and went on to pursue a career and is coming back to us with certifications and is now going to be a supervisor who provides our BITs with direction and coaching and as well as working with our teachers in the classroom on ways that we can better serve uh, the needs of those students who have very exceptional ways of learning. So I'd like to invite you, Ms. Diaz, to the podium. Hello. <coughs> I'm going to take 
Microsoft Student Student Hear Me. I'm thrilled to be back at MUSD, as you said. I started my career in ABA. Mike. Turn the mic on. Turn on the mic. Yep. Try it. Good? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> OK. Um, Stephanie Diaz, BCBA, Board Certified Behavior Analyst for the <laughs> district. I'm thrilled to be back at MUSD. I started my career in ABA 16 years ago when I worked as a behavior technician for Milpitas Unified. It was here that I learned how life-changing ABA support can be for students and their families. And in thinking about how fortunate they are to have these teams of not just teachers, but behavior technicians, psychologists, speech therapists, occupational therapists, <laughs> The goal, or the district strategic goal I'd most like to focus on is building a culture of we. I look forward to collaborating with not only the behavior technicians and the teachers, but all members of these teams to ensure that these students thrive. And I truly can't wait to get started. We awesome. can't either, so thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce everybody, our new coordinator too, of math, literacy, and English uh, learners uh, programs. And that is Ms. Shannon Souza, who comes to us from uh, Mount Pleasant, where she is currently a principal, and has had extensive um, career work in instructional coaching, particularly around math and interventions. and. She is truly data-driven and has so many new ways of looking at data that I'm excited to have her come aboard and teach all of us about those uh, strategies as well as math with an equity focus. Ms. Souza. <coughs> of English learners math literacy intervention programs. I'm excited to be part of a district that cultivates the culture of we, a district that focuses on equity, relationships, cultural responsiveness, diversity, inclusive practices, and raises all stakeholders' voices. I am most excited to help students along their educational pathway. It will take all of Milpitas' core values, perseverance, community, creative and innovation, respect and trust, and most importantly, students, to ensure all of our students can achieve. Thank you for entrusting me with this great responsibility. Thank you. And we have our new principal of Milpitas Rancho Milpitas Middle School, and uh, Mr. Vern. Yes. I'm sorry, I just drew a blank. Thank you, Mr. Vern Cruz. Actually, grew up in Milpitas and lived right off of Calaveras Boulevard in Driftwood Apartments, where he attended Rose and then Rancho before his parents moved and he went to a different school district for high school. But Mr. Cruz has a true, when, when you spend time talking with him, you can feel how impassioned he is about uh, learners, and in particular, coming back to serve the place where he started his life when he came here from the Philippines. And he has recently um, achieved his doctorate. It's a great work. And through that work, he has uh, established a new lens on how we create a culture of we through diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And I look forward to learning more from you as well. And he has a great drive for developing pathways and has already demonstrated a track record in his current school district where he is the principal in building partnerships and developing funding uh, opportunities for the school that he leads. And he is a lead, actually the lead principal at his current school district, so others look to him are ready for leadership. And I know that the times that I've encountered um, and got to meet Vern, 
that there's just something about you that I recognized as both charismatic, genuine, and also uh, knowledgeable. And that's why I was uh, very excited to see that you applied for our position and that you made it through the three different levels of interviewing. And here we are. So I'd like to invite you to the podium. Thank you, Superintendent Jordan and uh, school board members for this opportunity to serve the Milpitas community. When my family emigrated to the United States from the Philippines 38 years ago, attending Rose School was my first experience of schooling in the United States. As a student unfamiliar of the language and culture of my new home, it was disorienting and at many times frightening. At Rancho, I spent formidable childhood years exposed to the diversity of culture and language that is Milpitas. Like many of our parents in this community, my parents left our home and families to give their children a chance to be able to realize our dreams. Standing before you tonight is a manifestation of that dream, a proud product of Milpitas and a reminder that what we work tirelessly for every day can perhaps enable an immigrant child like me to reach their potential. Only as a collective can we achieve this. Only as partners in our community can we achieve a culture of we. I wanna thank my wife, Janelle, for her support, and my children, Isabella, Alexander, and Gabby for inspiring me to become a better version of myself daily. With this appointment, I hope to positively impact the lives of our students so they too can realize their full potential. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just point out that uh, your assistant principal, Amanda Gross, is sitting right behind you. <laughs> and then we won't be able to introduce her tonight because she's out of the country and also doesn't have access to uh, internet. But our, so we will introduce her in person to the boarding community at our next board meeting. I would like to share that uh, Shangri-La Mia Ramzan, who is currently the principal at Zinker Elementary, and who has a background in middle school where she was a middle school at uh, co-principal and also assistant principal at ACE Middle School and Franklin McKinley. And she will be our new Russell Middle School principal. So I look forward to having her say a few words at our next board meeting. And uh, we would like to invite Ms. Diaz, Ms. Uh, Dr. Cruz, and Ms. Souza up so we could take a picture with the board and cabinet.
Next, we have our video resolution for Pride Month. Mr. Forstner. Um, yeah, uh, uh, great practice that we're doing now. We're playing our video resolutions earlier in the meeting, and then the board will vote on them later. This one is resolution 2023.38, encouraging the celebration of the month of June as LGBTQ Pride Month. And uh, this was produced by members of the Milpitas High School True Colors Club. Resolution 2023.38, encouraging the celebration of the month of June as LGBTQ Pride Month. Whereas Milpitas Unified School District supports the rights, freedoms, and equality of those who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. And whereas those who took a stand for human rights and dignity at the Stonewall Inn in New York City on June 28, 1969, were pioneers of the LGBTQ movement, including two transgender women of color, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, were brave visible leaders in the uprising at Stonewall Inn. And whereas, in December of 1973, the board of the American Psychiatric Association voted to remove homosexuality from its list of mental illnesses. Whereas, in 1975, the Civil Service Commission eliminated the ban on um, the employment of homosexuals in the most federal jobs. Whereas, on January 8, 1978, Harvey Milk made national news when he was sworn in as an openly gay member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Whereas, in the LGBTQ community, has many historical figures that climbed to the top of their respective fields, such as WNBA stars Cheryl Swoopers and Sue Bird, Olympic figure skaters Brian Boitano and Johnny Weir, tennis stars Billie Jean King and Martina Navratilova, Olympic gold medalist driver diver <laughs> Craig Luganis, U.S. women's soccer star Megan Rapone. Rapinoe, uh, actors Ellen DeGeneres, Jodie Foster, and Neil Patrick Harris, and musicians Elton John, Ricky Martin, Freddie Mercury, and Sam Smith. Whereas in October of 1979, 75,000 people participated in the National March on Washington for lesbian and gay rights to demand equal civil rights, and whereas on October 5th, 2004, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals determined in Smith v. City of Salem that transgender employees are protected from workplace discrimination under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Whereas on October 28, 2009, the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act was passed by Congress and signed into law by President Obama, and the bill expanded existing federal hate crime laws to include crimes motivated by a victim's actual or perceived gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. Whereas on June 26, 2013, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in United States v. Windsor that Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA, was unconstitutional and that the federal government cannot discriminate against married lesbian and gay couples for the purposes of determining federal rights, benefits, and obligations. Whereas, on June 26, 2015, the Supreme Court of the United States in Obergefell v. Hodges decided by a vote of 5-4 to four that the 14th Amendment requires all states to license marriages between same-sex couples and to recognize all marriages that were lawfully performed out of state. Whereas, on May 13, 2016, the Department of Justice and Education released joint guidance to help provide educators the information they need to ensure that transgender students attend school in an environment free from discrimination based on sex. Whereas, in June of 2020, the Supreme Court of the United States decided by a vote of 6 to 3 that one cannot be fired simply for their sexual orientation or gender identity under the Civil Rights Law of 1964. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Milpitas Unified School District Board of Education recognizes that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer LGBTQ rights are human rights and are protected by the Constitution, that all Americans should be treated fairly and equally regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. The struggle of protesters and countless other LGBTQ people for equality and encourages the celebration of LGBTQ Pride Month to provide a continuing opportunity to learn the discrimination and inequality that has faced and continues to face the LGBTQ community. Passed and adopted by the Milpitas Unified School District Board of Education at a meeting held on June 13th, 2023 by the following vote. Thank you, Mr. Forstner. And now we will move into our recognitions with uh, Rajan Dasu, who is a Milpitas High School student and also the son of one of our team members, Ms. Kay Dasu, and her husband. And uh, we would like to recognize you, Rajan, for your achievements as an Eagle Scout and for your Eagle Scout project. So we'd like you to first come up for a photo, and then if you could tell us a bit about your project. And Rajan, would you tell us about your project? <clears throat> okay, uh, good evening, everyone. So my Eagle Scout project was in benefit for my temple, my Buddhist temple in uh, Japantown, San Jose. And so my Scoutmaster, who had passed away about a year ago due to cancer, was a very active community member. And he was, uh, we had like a garden committee for the temple and he was the, I guess, the leader, you could say. And so he came to me with this idea of this project. And due to his passing, I decided to uh, build this fence in his memory. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Rajan. Next, I would like to recognize uh, Satvika Ayar. And Satvika is going to be our board representative from Milpitas High School next year. <laughs> However, we, we are recognizing her today for her um, environmentalist uh, advocacy and for being recognized by the United Nations as a speaker. By the White House. Oh. Yeah. Well, <laughs> close. Yeah. White House. <laughs> <laughs> United Nations next. <laughs> and she's also been a student representative on our local control accountability plan and recently spoke with President Norwood and I and a group of about 20 other student leaders about what went well this year, where we could have improvements, and also um, is going to be one of the members of our new student leadership group that we're starting. So congratulations, Sabika. And would you please share a little bit about your work and you're, you're gonna be on again for student nutrition. Oh yeah, um, so I, I will be talking with the student nutrition services about my work bringing a plant-based menu to our school district. Um, we have culturally relevant and climate friendly options now thanks to um, our collaboration at like food like chana masala is now available across our school district. And um, I also wanna recognize the work that my club does, Environmental Society at Milpitas High School. So we handle a lot of the recy 
all the recycling on campus. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to become a board representative because a, lo a lot of our systems here can be a lot more sustainable and I hope to make an impact. So I want to recognize my club and then the district for being so supportive with all my projects. So thank you. Thank you very much, Savika. <laughs> okay. Okay, next we have <laughs> two of our students who are, two of our students who represent on Team USA in Taekwondo and won silver and gold medals at the Pan American Championships. Caden Ho for silver and Sydney Boone for gold. Sydney and Caden, would you share a bit about your experience as Taekwondo National Champions? Hi, we just made the USA national team earlier this year and competed at the Pan American Junior Championships in the Dominican Republic. It was a great experience. Um, maybe at first it was a little nerve wracking, but then you just have to have confidence on the mat and do your best. And I'd like to thank everyone who supported us. Uh, thank you. Okay, and then if we could have Satvika and your family and Kaden and Sydney, your families, and also Rajan and your families come up for a large group photo, that would be terrific. Next, I would like to do my state of the district update, which will be very short. So this is the, <laughs> almost the last one. One more after this, and then I will not be reporting on COVID again. <laughs> So um, since our last update with COVID, while the wastewater in our county still shows medium, the number of cases uh, since May 23rd for students has only been nine, and for team members, zero. And throughout the summer, tests are still available for your family. Uh, so all you have to do is come to the office here at Randall and we can provide those for you. This uh, last two weeks marked the transitions for many of our learners. 
actually about around a thousand of our learners as they leave Milpitas Unified in this phase of their journey and move on to institutes of higher ed, certifications, career pathways, whatever it might be. I wanted us to pause and remember that as Anita Kwong, who is going into ninth grade next year, as indicated in her artwork here, that every one of our learners has a dream and that we are here to provide learning experiences that will assist them in realizing those dreams. And I'm excited about uh, sharing these three individuals. Uh, and the first one here we have Maria Cuenca, who is one of the first graduates of the Middle College High School. This was our second year with the Middle College High School program. And Maria goes on with also, as do many other of our high school learners, with uh, dual enrollment credits in the community college, which are completely transferable to any UC or CSU. Maria has served uh, with the Milpitas Beat as an intern and, can, and is going to be pursuing journalism as a pathway. In the upper right, I unfortunately don't uh, have the name of this uh, particular graduate. However, I uh, got to watch her throughout the whole ceremony of the adult education uh, ceremony. And these learners completed their high school equivalency. For whatever reason, their life path uh, did not provide them with their completion of their high school diploma in the traditional way that many others do. But this uh, young woman, she came back, she completed it, she has her high school diploma now, and she was so thrilled for, I think, almost the entire ceremony. She was often in tears with the biggest smile ever, and she is here with her two children um, celebrating after the ceremony. And then in the bottom right, we have our valedictorian of Milpitas High School. And what caught my attention about this particular image is that is Ni Nguyen, and she is a longtime paraprofessional in our school district. I've known her as my time when I was at Russell as a teacher, when I was at Pomeroy as a principal, and periodically when I run into her over at Milpitas High School. And she is this valedictorian's grandmother. And she has many other grandchildren as well as her own children who have gone through Milpitas Unified School District. So we are about transitions and about congratulating and being with people along their way to the next um, stop along their life path. And I'm very proud of that. And we have one more person that I would like to recognize on his transition and his life path. And that is Assistant Superintendent Brunson. So if I could have everybody come up and present Norwood, if you could present him with that. We have our cabinet. And Mr. Brunson, you gotta be in the center. <laughs> So as President Norwood is um, preparing to give you a, um, a thank you from Melpitas Unified School District, I would like to say a few words to you. Uh, you came to us about five years ago, and I remember going out to Davis, California, to meet you uh, again one-on-one -on -one in person and to really delve deep into your why. And um, I had to determine between you and another candidate um, which one of you was the fit. And it was difficult. 
and that's why I chose to drive out to meet you and have another conversation again. And in that conversation, you shared uh, how much your purpose is around kids and learning, and also that you understood that the kids, our learners, also have adult learners who work with them, and that if we create uh, working environments where our adult learners are satisfied and have um, a sense of pride and feel trusted, then our younger learners are going to get the best education possible. And uh, that's what you've demonstrated these last five years. Through COVID, it was super hard. Uh, there were a lot, of, a lot of times when there was fear and anxiety and you worked with our uh, association leaders to create different memos of understanding about how we would progress through the different aspects of COVID. And there were times when you had a lot of anger directed towards you and, and you still took it uh, for the team and helped move us through things. And you continue even today as your last official day in the office and as our soon-to-be interim assistant soup, uh, Damon James, shared earlier today. Even to the last minute, you're making sure that everything is getting done and that you're setting uh, Damon and the HR team up for success. And it's just what you do. You really feel a sense of commitment and a sense of family. And that is something that we here in Milpitas Unified cherish and why you were a great fit for joining our team. And I wanna thank you for all of the time that you've given us. And thank you to Cecilia for saying yes and moving with you out here from Davis and packing up your dogs to come with you and leaving your kids, who are adult kids, I have to say, <laughs> leaving them behind in Davis to take care of things and you trusted and I appreciate that about both of you. And President Norwood has something. <laughs> President Norwood has something to share with you. Right here, and he says, "You lift up learners. You shine for leaders. You're a star, Jonathan. You've achieved as a teacher of many. Thank you." Would any of the board members like to say anything? You know, Jonathan, a lot has been said, but I think thank you for being, making MUSD your finish line. You know, because a lot of times when you look at the finish line, it's a hard sprint, and you brought all your experience, all your knowledge to make, you know, us as a district as the best possible before you leave the legacy. Uh, moving forward. So really, thank you so much for that. Yeah. Jonathan, um, I saw you when you first came in. Now I am seeing you as you leave. And <laughs> that's right. Uh, so over these five years, even though I was not specifically here, I still was watching you and you were still doing a one heck of a job. So I want to thank you uh, from the community's perspective. I think you, along with your team, along with MUC as a whole, navigated this crazy thing called COVID extremely well. And I know there were tough days. There were days like, why am I here <laughs> kind of days. So I want to just thank you, appreciate all that hard work and nav helping us navigate that challenge. Buddy, <laughs> the first night you came to accept the job from Cheryl at the boardroom, do you remember that night? It was very crowded, it was also our volunteer night, I think. And Jonathan being who Jonathan was, is very friendly, very outgoing. We kind of hit it off from that night, kidding with his wife about it, the position he's taking on and working with me as president of MTA. But honestly, you've become not only a great mentor to me, but a friend. And I treasure our friendship, our long talks, our short talks, 
which are not very many short talks with Jonathan, as we all know. <laughs> it's okay, we love you anyway. But I have cherished the last five years. We have done good stuff together with Clarissa and Suzette and, and Damon. We really did nail COVID, if you could nail such a thing as that. But I am proud to call you my friend. I am excited for you and Cecilia for retirement, grandchildren, more grandchildren, and hopefully not moving too far away from us. So we'll see you in Kiwanis because you don't get to leave us yet. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the things, sometimes you hear people talk about, you know, their work wife or work husband, and, you know, I was just realizing as people were talking, all of the things that they said about Jonathan that are true, but I was be thinking personally, like, I'm losing my work partner, and there are definitely were times where we talked about the fact that we talked more than he did with his wife, Cecilia, because of the amount of time that we spent together. So I'm just going to miss um, that motivation, um, particularly during the hard times, but also the wisdom that I've gained um, in moving forward and learning how to work with the very intricate um, and special stakeholders that we have in Milpitas. So thanks, Jonathan, and see you soon. Okay, so I'm thinking back to when um, I was first hired, and I remember you had to wait for me for a while to be able to come on board, but I remember when you were grooming me or recruiting me, I'm not exactly sure, and talking about coming to the district, and you said, I will always be there, I will always take your call. I'm not just saying that to get you to join MUSD, but I mean it. You held to your word. So thank you for picking up my phone calls, even when they were early in the morning or late at night. Thank you for being an advocate for our staff and for our kids who are the ultimate work of why we do the work we do every day. And as others have said, congratulations on a long career. Enjoy your time with your grandbaby and grandbabies maybe, your family, and just enjoying retirement and try to stay away from the work. Uh, similar to others, Jonathan, I just want to say thank you. Uh, you were critical in bringing me here to MUSD. Um, and like Mary Jude said, I think one of the things that you pitched me on is, hey, I'm going to be your team member and I'm going to be here whenever you need help. And that is, you've been true to your word. Whenever I call, whenever I text, um, you always pick up. And I appreciate that. And uh, we can always talk through things. And, and that has meant a lot as a new person coming into the district. I wish you the best of luck uh, with your next steps. I know you are eager. You can't, you like, you just smile so much when you talk about your grandbaby. So I'm excited for you to uh, just immerse yourself into travel and being a grandpa and, uh, and outriggering. I will have to come watch one of your competitions one of these days. I can't believe you've already run a race there or rode a race. I don't know. <laughs> wow, Jonathan. Um, well, you probably didn't know this. I, I can share with you now. And I still remember <laughs> the day, <laughs> the day when um, Cheryl broke the news to me and Norma. Norma was our um, retired assistant to back then learning development. That day we were, we had an event at a high school, and we were walking towards a high school and Cheryl was so excited as Cheryl said, hey ladies, because we have been operated just the three of us for a while, almost a year, three of us and then as a cabin and, and she was so excited to share with us that you know, you said yes to the district. So we were just like, yes, finally, we have a big brother now joining us because Cheryl has been our big sister when me and Norma kind of um, get ourselves in trouble sometimes. But now, you know, we were so excited uh, you join us and um, this past five years and uh, both our departments, we established a relationship. And I remember from the very beginning, your first day, you walk into my office and um, you're very sincere because of a payroll and a human relations. We work hand in hand, and we don't necessarily always work um, 
you know, we have our moments, but you said, Wendy, I would like to establish a relationship with you, start from the top, and we'll work out both departments. So uh, we made that happen. And thank you, I will definitely miss you, our big brother. Thank you. Thank you for all the service to the Melpitas Unified School District, helping, believing in the culture of we in terms of always wanting to be collaborative, always wanting to figure out how to have the right conversations and bring the right people to this table. And, and always keep the, you always talked about students first. You always talked about kids first. You always talked about the reason why we're here and how working with the adults created that atmosphere so that we could be successful for the kids. And because of you and your leadership, as I mentioned earlier, the superintendent and the cabinet has had the time to grow, has the time to work through things, and set the course for the future of this Milpitas Unified School District, which is our target, is a world-class education. And you have been a big part of that. So kudos to you, and thank you very much for your service. Thank you, everyone. And uh, can we have Cecilia come up? through this as you can tell I've already started crying and it's it's um you know Belpitas is a special place and um, after 36 years in education you don't know where you're going to end up when you start your career and today I was able to offer two teachers a position uh, in our district and a counselor and they were the last hires I'll ever make and it's just exciting that uh, the work that we get to do in HR is uh, about onboarding and, and getting the right people on the team um, you know, when you get the right people on the bus and they're in this room, uh, everything happens for the kids. And I'll end my little talk here with, about students eventually, but I want to thank my wife of 40 years. We just celebrated our 40th anniversary uh, last weekend. Um, Cheryl, uh, yeah, Damon said that work partner, work spouse, you know, Cheryl's like that to me here. At, and, you know, she, she really cares about HR. She lived and breathed HR, and uh, to follow in her footsteps was indeed an honor. And now that she's superintendent of the year, I mean, that's amazing uh, in itself for our community. Um, but Cheryl, it all started with you, and I just can't thank you enough for your trust and your confidence, and, um, uh, and allowing me to bring my dog to work when we were in COVID, <laughs> and, uh, and just visit people. Um, and it was hard, but it was a good heart because of the people you get to serve and the people you get to be with uh, each and every day. And so, um, you know, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Mary Jude and Preeti. Um, when I was hired five years ago, it was just um, Lori and Heather. Heather, if you're out there, thank you. Um, she carried uh, me to help me with the history of Milpitas, as well as Diana and Suzette and other leaders in the district. And then um, when Damon came on board, life got better and then COVID hit. And when you have the right team with you um, during that time period, uh, anything can happen. And so, you know, I'm so grateful, Kay, you're here tonight. I know for your son, but I'll think it's for me too. And, uh, but we're gonna miss Kay and, you know, Virginia and our other Virginia, Mary Elena, Kirithi and Catherine. Uh, and we adopted Senny and Scott into our department. You guys are amazing, um, the trustees, uh, you know, Chris and uh, Robert, you were on the board at the time when I was hired, and, um, and it's exciting that you're still with us. And then uh, uh, Kelly came on board, and then Min and Anu, and Han, who's not with us, she went on to, to serve the city at a greater uh, level. But, you know, working with trustees who operate through the lens of what's best for our students is what, uh, it's a dream for cabinet members, because it's always about the kids. 
and then our students, because our adult students are not kids, right? And so um, I just thank you for your leadership of this district and taking care of us. Diana Orlando, you are the best union leader I've ever worked with in my entire career. And it's not because of um, uh, just that she's this icon in Milpitas, because she will spit and chew you out, you know, if you uh, <laughs> aren't student first. And we learned right away that we were always about the kids. And, and we had agreed to disagree very rarely, and, um, but it was always good to know that she was so supportive of our leaders as well as our teachers in this district. And just you being here for me tonight says volumes about who or why we have such a great relationship. I want to thank um, Suzette too. I don't know if she's still here, but she, you know, she's also been a, a rock uh, for us with our classified employees and who mean the world to us. My, if you haven't heard me, my grandmother was a classified employee and so was I back in the day. So our classified do make things happen in this district and you're so appreciated. To our principals, I see some of you and assistant principals here. Um, you guys uh, are the front lines and always have been, always will be. So thank you for being there for our staff and our students. And uh, you're like little superintendents all over the district, you know? And uh, you do great work and uh, you can't be thanked enough. Our office teams, SNS, Sandy's here. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Chen for technology, LD, Raquel, Marissa. Uh, Yvonne, thank you for your leadership of that department. MOT, Van was here earlier, and the rest of the team, business services, Wendy and Shani, thank you. Um, I did some quick math real quick, real quick. Um, since I've been here, um, life turns over. People look for opportunities to grow. And uh, Damon, you don't know this, but we've hired 65 administrators since I've been here. And that's, that's a lot of work. But think about 180 teachers and think about 75 to 100 classified employees and it's for the students and, uh, and, and that's the joy of this job. And so, um, yeah, it's just been a full circle. And so relationships matter. The quotes that mean the most to me are assume best intent. Um, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. The problem is not always the problem and you gotta find ways to say yes. And I'll end with this, and I'll get back to the meeting, sorry. Um, I used to end a graduation of promotion with the proverb that came from the Maasai warriors. And when they would greet each other, they'd always say, Kaseren Ingara, which is, how are the children? And the response that everybody wanted to hear was, the children are well. So as I leave that Milpitas, if I ask you right now, how are the children? Please say they are well, because you heard what they said tonight. That was powerful. I was telling Preeti, I cannot believe how amazing these students are. And though I'm just retiring, the future assistant superintendent of HR is in this room, right? With these children. And so when I ask you, how are the children? The children? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Somebody hugged me. That was hard. <laughs> so we'll do a uh, we'll do a five minute uh, break for cupcakes in the back. Thank you.
Kelly. Okay. She went for a break. <laughs> ready for round two? Huh? I said ready for round two. Thank you, Dr. Like this is short. I know. Hopefully. Thank you for everyone uh, for the celebration time with uh, Mr. Brunson. And let us continue our meeting. Item, agenda item 16, Superintendent's Executive Cabinet Report. Thank you, President Norwood. I will start with our principal report with Principal Klein of Pomeroy. We were prepared to be fourth on that list. Uh, so my name is Nicole Klein, the principal at Marshall Pomeroy Elementary, and this evening I'm joined with Anastasia Hersefinis, our wonderful, I want to say the name, the ever-expanding Miss Hersefinis herself, who is pregnant with twins and ready to give birth, maybe tonight. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. No, not tonight. Okay, yes, we still have summer school, so not tonight, not until after summer school. Otherwise, we're looking for all hands on deck. <laughs> uh, but tonight we're here for Pomeroy and all of um, the greatness and joy that we bring uh, to the Pomeroy community or that the community brings to us. And the focus this past year and moving into next year is going to be the social emotional gaps that the pandemic has um, brought to light and some of the strategies we've put into place with the uh, MTSS, so the multi-tiered systems of support uh, pyramid and what we've been doing with that work. So we've got a video. Oh. I start each morning in my classroom with morning meeting. Morning meeting starts with the students greeting each other. They often greet each other in different languages from their home cultures. Then we move into a sharing time. First, they turn and talk to a partner about whatever question I have posed for the day. It may be something serious or something silly. 
Sometimes we discuss the character traits of the month. And finally, we close with an activity. It may be something that is reinforcing a skill, or it could be something to help us get to know each other better. This allows us to get some time to talk to each other and to build community. I had some violent tendencies, um, violent and rude tendencies at the beginning of the year. I was sent to office often, um, and they affected people negatively because um, I had a lot of notoriety throughout the year, and I also influenced other people to jo join with my violent tendencies. I originally thought it was, um, I would, I would, it wouldn't, I wouldn't improve, but then um, here we are. Uh, I had a, I have a lot of, I had a lot of um, tendencies, so I um, learned to pass, get past them using like, using um, vision with my hands. Actually, snapping was one of them. I got out of my um, one of my tendency by snap by snapping. Um, um, but my experiences have um, so negatively. A lot of my experiences have negatively affected affected me and um, others. But I feel like, uh, but I feel like um, I, as a person, I've grown past them and I can res now resist those tendencies and a lot of and a lot of sort of practices like I have learned to take fid fidget with my hands and like take walks when I'm uh aggressive when I feel aggressive I'd say um don't give up on the people don't give up on the people you love um because uh, you gotta because you gotta impress them and you don't just don't let them down and that's about it thank you Uh, and so one of the things I also wanted to share with um, my friend, Ben Lamb, who is going to middle school next year. New principal's not here, uh, but um, well, she's vacationing. But uh, it's just exciting to see Ben grow over the years. Uh, and this year in particular, we had some struggling students that really just didn't know how to interact with their peers. And Ben was our go-to. And he was able to support those. It happened to be his new best friend uh, was a TK student and was able to really pair up with him. And it worked twofold. It was able to establish that relationship so that TK student felt safe in this new environment, that he had a role model to lean on. And Ben was able to see um, some of the same um, challenges within that student that he had within himself. And so he was able to see like, ooh, I can give him this advice, he'll try it out, I can kind of adapt some of that advice that I'm giving out and see if it can also transform the way I'm working in my own social circles. So it was just a wonderful full circle opportunity to see Ben really engage in that work and become that positive model um, where he was able to receive that feedback that he was craving, where his negative interactions with peers was, was getting him attention, but not necessarily the attention that he wanted and needed. So it was a great growing opportunity that we're looking to continue uh, in that direction next school year and beyond. So thank you very much for having us tonight. Thank you very much, and I appreciated being able to get a glimpse into the classroom on Tier 1 and Tier 2 strategies. Any comments from the board? Uh, I just want to say that, you know, that's a perfect example of data points when I ask about restorative justice and, and how to measure, you know, our social-emotional uh, learning. It's, you know, it, I, I know it's not necessarily uh, numbers or data points, but stories like that tell you that you are getting that feedback. You, you know, the strategies that Ben was using, that made perfect sense. I mean, and, and those are the examples where we know that this type of work is working, right? This, this type of strategy are indeed making an impact on how our kids are learning, right? So that's what I'm kind of looking for. Thank you, so board I want to thank you for that. Thank you, board member Zhang. 
Um, I just wanted a quick question. The Milpitas Elementary Olympics, um, the results of that, did, did that, that support any of the MTSS progress that you needed in, in your campus? I'm so competitive. <laughs> uh, and while it, we didn't come home with the trophy, we're giving it to Kurtner this year. Um, but it, it did build that sense of community and belonging for a lot of our um, active fidgety students. Uh, and one thing that I brought back to our staff was that um, desire and hope that more teachers and more staff members will be able to see those students, those wiggly, wild children um, in their environment and being able to see, speaking specifically to the medal ceremony, it was a long length of time because every child is so deserving of having that spotlight on them and having the community gaze upon them. Uh, but seeing our most wiggly children wiggling and moving all around, but the moment they recognized a name or the name of their school or a peer, they were immediately in tuned. And so it was, that's what they needed. They need to be able to be seen in a different way where it's not a, you need to sit still because then I know you're paying attention, but we all pay attention in different ways. And so the Olympics is a highlight of a different pathway and model for our students in the community. So it was, yes, it did. And I'm glad you brought me back up here to answer that one, because I also wanted to say that um, we're also building in opportunities in the high school summer program to highlight different areas of growth for our students. And a peek into that, um, we're asking our students that as they complete their courses this summer, to give some feedback and tips for their peers. And today, one of the students finished a math course in like record time, because it's only day two. But they worked their, their behind off. And their uh, first piece of advice was, I turned off my phone for two whole days, and I wasn't going to turn it on until I finished this course. And the second piece of advice wasn't advice, but they just wanted it to be known that they were pushed by their teacher in a way where they didn't feel ashamed and they didn't feel scolded when they were behind in their work. And so they said that that gave me the strength to continue persevering and moving through at a quick pace to finish the course because of their teacher. And so giving the students an opportunity, and it's gonna go both ways, so I'm hoping to share that data in August, um, of ways that teachers are able to highlight some of the students, because these are some students that just need that different environment and that in order to have that sense of belonging and to be able to be recognized for that. So I look forward to sharing that uh, yeah. in the future. The high school? That's students? with the high school. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. fantastic. We recognized seven of the students today, so it was it was fun and exciting. Thank yeah, you. That's, Thank that's you. exactly what, that's great examples of, you know, having someone understand or understand where that kid's at and figuring out how to challenge. Mm -hmm. not, not, not just challenge, but how to challenge that kid mm -hmm. so that they are motivated to, to get it done. Because yeah. they probably knew it's doable, it's mm -hmm. just that no one challenged them in the right way. Exactly. So. Thank you, Board Member Zhang. Thank and thank you, you Principal Klein, very much. I will just go straight down the line with uh, very short updates from each of our cabinet members. Very quick, I have two acknowledgments uh, to share for tonight. One is from this past week, a staff from buildings 200, 300, 400, and 550 worked diligently to pack and clean their office for our move. So the phase two of innovation campus demolition could start on time. Especially thank you to our two site custodians, 
yeah. David Lopez and Rolando Castro. They did a tremendous assistance significantly to help us to improve our efficiency. Besides uh, packing their own item, they constantly empty the trash bins and uh, making multiple trips during the day and uh, to help out. So we truly appreciate their efforts. And also very quickly, I would like to acknowledge our MOT, Maintenance Operation Transportation Team for their support during the promotion and the graduation ceremonies. Just very quick, the following staff, um, Jared Acosta, Lauren Salamanca, uh, David Artiega, Jose uh, Damien Cisneros, Jose Jimenez, Jeremy Garlett, George Sanchez, Shervin Antolin, Jorge Hernandez, Mike Snyder, and uh, Josh Molly, along with our MOT director, Van Nguyen, and the supervisors, Abner Ames and Jesus Chiguaya. Thank you. So it's summer, but our campuses are still buzzing. We have summer programs in full swing at Randall, Rose, Russell, and, and our middle college campuses. There are approximately 400 elementary students and 400 secondary students participating in various programs. At the elementary and secondary level, students and staff are already cultivating community by helping each other navigate new campuses. Um, a couple of highlights I'd like to share are that RAFT, a local nonprofit, has helped um, create STEAM projects for us, which provides students opportunities to build machines, practice the basics of coding, apply academic vocabulary, and create narratives to accompany their design. So it's fully interdisciplinary. And a fun fact, the professional development for these units was delivered by an MUSD alum, Eric Welker, class of 94. And continuing on that same theme, uh, as Preeti mentioned, uh, in alignment with the summer school programming, uh, we also um, launched our extended school year, which is ESY, or special supports and services through teacher, um, through teacher uh, classroom support or through related services for our students with disabilities. Uh, we have 20 special education classrooms that are open for our preschool through our post-secondary students across um, all of the campuses that would be Randall, Rose, Russell, Middle College, and then also our preschool at uh, Rose Child Development Center. Uh, in addition to those services for special education, also we have our summer uh, program for our Child Development Center for supporting um, students, preschoolers, whose families need childcare during the summer. That concludes our uh, learning and development report this evening, thank you. I uh, just want to remind the community we're still trying to fill some open positions for both certificated and classified. So go to musd.org, district teams, human relations, and there is a job waiting for you to hear it and see and work with these amazing students that we have here in Milpitas. It was also a pleasure to attend almost every single one of our uh, secondary schools promotion and graduates graduations and hearing our students speak and tell their stories and, and their wisdom uh, was truly inspiring. And uh, since this is my last report, I just wanna say thank you again, everybody, for what you've given to me is way more than I could have ever given back. So thank you so much. And that concludes my report. Thank you, cabinet team. Thank you, cabinet team. In item 17 on the agenda, we have board group agreements. For the sake of time, we are going to um, bypass the board group agreements and go right to uh, item 18, board communication requests. And we will start with board member Zhang. Um, for sake of time, I will pass. Board member Naka. Good evening and happy LGBTQ Pride Month, everyone. Speaking of the events and celebrations and representations, to list some of them that I attended, I take time. So Synod's epic PBIL exhibition and Rancho's music concert, Leo Murphy's Athletic Awards at MHS, AVID graduation also at MHS, MUSD's employee appreciation, thank you every employee of the MUSD, and MESO, the Milpitas Elementary Science Olympiad, Capstone Projects, and uh, the Rise Six Sigma presentations, which were amazing. 
the special screening of Dealing with Dad, which focused on mental health awareness, and uh, some cross-cultural issues followed by the Q&A with co County Behavioral it's Health cool. Services Department. Thank you to Supervisor Otto Lee, AACI, and City of Milpitas for all their efforts. And uh, coming to June, we all know it's this time of the year for the graduations and promotions, so alongside my fellow board members, uh, I was at post-secondary graduation, African Ancestry student celebration, Russell and Rancho promotions, Synod 6 grade promotion, graduations at Cal Hills and MHS, <coughs> and the first inaugural class of middle college high graduation, which was historic. Also, our adult ed ESL promotion and graduation ceremonies, which were phenomenal. So it was truly memorable to celebrate our very own Diana Orlando and Jonathan Brunson's MUSD journeys. So thank you for everything that you all do for us. And I was also at Milpitas Rotary Dinner to help uh, benefit MUSD uh, through all uh, the scholarships and books uh, that the money was raised for. So volunteered at Charity Bingo, was at Chamber and uh, Sunny Hills monthly meetings. And May 28th was proclaimed as Telugu Pride Day, because this is the month of pride, by the city of Milpitas, and I was honored to be part of it, so thank you. Also, I briefly wanted to mention that Girl Scouts of Northern California Service Unit has recognized few of our middle schoolers from our MUSD who were Silver Award recipients. Attended San Jose Spotlight's Polity Beat, which was another, uh, another wonderful event. Thank you to Super, uh, Superintendent Jordan and uh, Mr. Bob Nunes, of course, for extending this special invitation to our MUSD board. And last but not least, I am super happy to share that my older daughter graduated from MHS <laughs> and my younger one from Rancho Middle, class of 2023, yay, <laughs> proud mom. <laughs> uh, and that concludes my report. Back to you, President Noble. Thank you, Board Member Naka. Board Clerk Yiptron. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I attended a lot of events that my colleague here attended, and uh, you know, I, I did get to witness my sixth grader, uh, you know, promoted from Burnett. She'll be at Russell next year, and then my eighth grader at Russell will be at MHS next year. Um, and you know, I did attend um, a lot of the. Um, Promotions like my colleague here with you know Cow Hills Adult Ed Middle School Middle College celebration for Diana Orlando and Jonathan's retirement, the best to them. And um, before I like to uh, end my uh, uh, my list, I, I would like to uh, make a request for a study session on MUSD's hiring practices. Um, I would like to know who are all the stakeholders involved. Um, how, how do we, um, how many levels are there? Do we look at uh, internals first before hiring outside the district? Um, I'm just trying to get a better understanding about our hiring practices. From sure. another proud mom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Board Vice President Neil. Uh, in the absence of repeating everything, I'll concede my time. <laughs> I, I concur. In the absence of repeating everything, I concede my time. Thank you, board members, for being extremely busy. Uh, to being at all the graduations and continuing to support the community. Uh, indeed, uh, time, talent, and also treasure. Item 19, reports. Uh, 19A, business services. Okay, well, good evening again. I'm very excited to welcome our amazing student nutrition team Ooh. here to present a report to our board tonight. Good evening, board members, executive cabinets, and family members. Why are they standing so far behind you? Why are they way, why are they, they're way, they're way back there. They're like, we're not, we're not sure what she's going to say. <laughs> my name is Sandy Huynh. I'm the director of Nutrition Services and Warehouse. Uh, tonight, along with my team, uh, we would like to give you an update about our federal nutrition programs, as well as highlights about um, our operations this school year. Uh, I would like my team to introduce themselves to you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sucheta Gihani. I'm Student Nutrition Services Supervisor, and I oversee secondary schools. 
and it's been, I have completed 10 years at MUSD this year. Good evening, everyone. I'm Fatima Tabib, Field Operations Supervisor to, for Elementary Schools, and I've uh, completed nine years at MUSD. Good evening, everyone. My name is Carmen Rodriguez. I'm a satellite operator at Russell, Thomas, uh, Russell Middle School, and I've been with MUSD for 19 years. Hello, my name is Peter Nederson. I am the Central Kitchen Lead for Student Nutrition. I believe I'm in this position. This is my ninth year, but 10 years with the district, getting awesome. close to the time I spent as a student. Thank you. So. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Delisai, um, Satellite Kitchen Operator at Randall Elementary School, and this is my fifth year in MUSD. Thank nice. you. Hi, I'm Satvika Ayer, and this is my upcoming fourth year at Milpitas High School. <laughs> <laughs> next, next, next slide, Scott. Thank you. So since resuming school after the pandemic two years ago, we've been operating the Universal Meals Program at where we serve breakfast and lunch to all students at no cost. Um, and this school year, um, we've served nearly 1.4 million meals, breakfast increased by 42% and lunch increased by 22% compared to pre-COVID. Um, so this equates to over 400,000 more meals that we prepared and serve. And um, our operation and our infrastructure is the same before and after COVID. So we are maximizing our operation. Next slide, please. There have been questions from families uh, about our menu planning process. So I'm gonna go over it a little bit today. Um, the main thing is that when we are planning our menus, we make sure we are meeting the nutrition guidelines by the federal and the state. And you can see on this slide that there are different grade levels that require different nutritional needs. And there are specific uh, requirements for calories, saturated fat, and sodium. In July 2023, um, we are gonna have to uh, adhere to stricter sodium requirements and targets that we need to meet in our menus. And there's also a proposed rule to limit sugar in our school meals. Um, also, our school meals have zero trans fat and at least 80% of the grains that are offered weekly must be whole grain rich. Now our average meal cost for the food part of it is $2.36, and this is just the cost of food. It really does not include the direct costs such as fuel, equipment maintenance, and labor which is required to prepare and serve these meals. When you add the food cost and the direct cost, we are actually breaking even with the reimbursement rate which is $5.30. Next slide, please. So this past year, um, running the Central Kitchen, we do about 4,000 meals every day with about, on average, about 10 people, uh, 10 to 11 people, and we only have a couple hours to do it in. Um, that includes putting prep, putting it together in the line, getting things ready to be transported so we can go out to the sites where it can be heated and served. Um, next, no, next time. Now this process is hard because we need to make sure the food can withstand the entire process. So by the time it gets to the site, it's, it's edible. You know, it's with safe, it looks decent enough for the kids, because kids are very visual with what, how they eat. Yep. Um, and we have to keep it within budget. Um, And within the yeah within budget and the nutrition guidelines, um, and sorry, don't speak public very much anymore. Um, what else? Yeah, next slide. Next. Scott, next slide. And this year we also got an opportunity to do some refresher training with some professional chefs that came in through some of our partners with 
knife skills, safety, running different equipment, and different looks on how to serve different meals, recipes, testing recipes, and options like that. And we're hoping, I'm hoping we're able to do more stuff like that in the future. Next slide. Randall Elementary has a state-of-the-art kitchen facility with higher capacity to do more insight and serve open food. This spring, we offered pizza, pepperoni, and cheese pizza at Randall. Baking the whole pies in the oven, cutting and slicing and serving to students on the line. Pizza days are very popular with the students. They look forward on it. About 10 to 30 more meals served on the stage. For Rander Carnival, we co collaborated with the school and were able to alter the menu to provide um, base meal and hot dogs prepared on site. This type of open service helped out back of packing, packaging and increase the appeal of the food. At Randall and Matos, the kitchen facilities give us the option to serve more fresh variety of seasonal fruits. We serve fresh strawberries this spring, which were hit. Students eat more fruits when it is sliced versus whole fruits. Thank you. Uh, this school year, to boost the collection of our meal applications, SNS worked with um, Wendy and Business Services to offer an incentive for the schools who had the highest number of uh, outreach done for applications. And the incentive was a farmer's market. Uh, the winners of the competition were Spangler, Pomeroy, and Burnett. Um, in February, SNS uh, collaborated with Food for Thought to bring the farmer's market to these schools, um, where a variety of fruits and vegetables were um, offered and the students could go shopping. Uh, the event was a learning opportunity for the students. The younger students learned about the uh, nutrition yeah. of the fruits and veggies, where the, the farms where the food is from, and the older students, it was a learning opportunity. Um, they practiced their math skills and uh, when purchasing with their allowance. Um, it was a very fun and fruit, fruitful learning opportunity. Oh for all of the students. <laughs> um, next slide, please. At Russell Middle School, uh, we have been doing two lunch periods during this school year, and it has made a huge difference in meal participation. Our lunch counts have doubled, and almost 70% of the Russell students eat at lunch at the cafeteria. Since there are fewer students coming to eat at a time, supervision and sitting has improved, the lunch lines are shorter, and there is more manageable to serve the students. My experience with the two lunch periods has been a positive one, and I hope the school continues to keep the two lunches so the kids can keep benefit from the lunch program. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sattvika Iyer, and I'm a rising senior at MHS and a president of our school's environmental society. I began working with Sacheta and Sandy in my sophomore year when I wanted to create a plan-based menu that was at once cl climate friendly and culturally relevant. In the, over the past two years, we, we were able to introduce new vegan items on our school menu that served over 3,200 students, keeping central kitchen distribution, USDA guidelines, and supply chain shortages in mind. I learned a lot. Um, my team promotes the vegan menu at the cafeteria during lunch, working alongside our SNS staff, and every day I enjoy becoming a cafeteria lady and being up with them and working with them. <laughs> and we become a bridge between school food and our student voice. Today we have distributed countless vegan and vegetarian meals, like chana masala, which now have a permanent spot on all of our menus in the school district. I distribute and analyze student feedback forms to help our staff get an idea of student needs, facilitate taste testing so that our students have an idea of what's going to be on the menu, and um, educate on the environmental impacts of our food choices district-wide with flyers and lessons I hope to continue as elected board representative. When I spoke to senators and congressmen at the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health, I used this powerful case study that showcased the bravery and innovation of our school district, and it was clear that the nations needed, needed solutions like these. 
I wouldn't have had this opportunity without Satyatha Gahani and Sandy Hyun and the SNS staff at MHS. And I'm so grateful for their support and belief in, M in MUSD students. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, for the upcoming school year, we're gonna focus on a few things. Um, we're gonna continue to serve free meals to all students in the district, um, and we're gonna build our capacity to continue to meet the increasing demand of the students. Uh, one new change is we will no longer collect meal applications. Um, instead, the district will be collecting household income to get the data for federal funding for schools. Um, Child nutrition programs is very heavily regulated in many different aspects. This coming fall, we will be under a procurement review. Um, and lastly, but not least, uh, we will be looking to increase more cooking at the central kitchen. Um, cooking requires more staffing, and staffing is something that we struggle with, but we want to go into the direction of you know, freshly prepared meals. But uh, by cooking more, that means we need to focus on providing culinary training opportunities to our staff. We need to invest in our central kitchen equipment and replace um, our infrastructure. And we have a very exciting partnership that we are setting up with Brigade. It is an organization with uh, culinary professionals who provide resources to institutional kitchens like ours to reach our goals. Um, so we do have a lot of exciting things going on, and I cannot thank my team enough SNS and Warehouse uh, for working throughout the pandemic, before and after, um, like uh, assist, uh, uh, Assistant Superintendent uh, Brunson says, if you have a good team, you can do anything, and that is very true. Um, I think my team definitely doesn't give themselves enough credit for what they do. Um, I want to let everyone know that uh, Peter is also a product of MUSD. He's been through since preschool here. Nice. Um, <laughs> Rochelle is um, the classified employee of the year, and Randall has speak very highly of her. Um, Carmen, she, uh, Russell, it's, the, the data speaks for itself. 70% .7 of the students eat at that school. Um, Carmen is the, Russell is the school that we go to to do innovations because Carmen is very flexible and very adjustable. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I want to thank um, Fatima and Sucheta for, you know, covering while I was on leave in the beginning of the school year and, and you know, continue the operation. And last but not least, Savika, it's been a pleasure working with her. She is so passionate. She knows what she wants to do. She comes yes. to us with <laughs> ideas. And I just love that we have that partnership uh, and she's been able to become the bridge for us to students. And thank you all for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'll start by saying, um, well, welcome back. And I'm glad to see that your team is intact. You know, when you first when you first took the position and you had a vision for SNS uh, in the district, you continue to move forward uh, with that vision. I remember several board members, we were getting letters from oh, yeah. uh, middle mm -hmm. schoolers about the lunch type of thing and what they weren't liking. And so to hear that you hear that, have that number at 70% and you have the vegan and the culturally relevant options, those were all parts of the things that you first talked about when you got this position. So to see it in fruition, to see that your dream team continues to stay intact and that you decided to come back, we're, we're very grateful for that. So thank you very much and kudos to your team. Yeah. Yes. So, so I, I also, because I remember you. Oh, when Rob, I Rob, the first Rob, time. Rob, hold on, Kelly. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, Rob can go first. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so when I first met you, you had this energy, you had this, this vision, and you know, five years afterwards, you still have that vision, that energy, and that is something that is um, representative of someone who's passionate about what, they're, what they wanna do and make a difference in our school district, so I wanna thank you for that. Okay, Kelly. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I want to thank you for bringing your team here. And, um, you know, I think, I don't know, maybe it was a couple years ago, I mentioned, you know, there were some complaints and we're getting the letters and um, the fact that you have a student, you know, on, on your team now to that bridge, that, you know, that um, 
help you, I guess, the, the team um, improve and the, the menu and all that stuff. Even my own kids, they actually like the food too now <laughs> and they're, they're eating. And um, yeah, I just wanna say like, thank you so much for I guess, listening to our students, um, you know, having uh, different ideas, bring our student here to help with the menu and your staff, your team, it's amazing. So I wanna thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I remember a few years ago, my girls used to come to you uh, for the summer meal programs distribution, and they always love to go back uh, to uh, volunteer there. So it's, it's an amazing team that you have. I'm sure it's, it's going to uh, you know, ramp up with more, many more feedbacks that you can implement and make it better and better. So thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, uh, team. And I think the biggest thing is the access of the food to all students, which you know, highlights mm -hmm. the fact that you're touching more of the students in our district, right? Because we're able to feed all of them. And with that, the vision to help you know introduce you know culturally relevant food, and also with the you know upcoming uh, updated guidelines or restrictions, depending on how you look at it, right? Um, making sure that our kids are getting healthy food, and I appreciate Savita just learning as far as the regulations and all the rules as far as how to get what your idea is, but work within that construct to get that out there. Um, you know, plant-based uh, foods are very organic, healthy, and available, right? So you don't need meat to, to necessarily supplement, not all the time. Um, but I appreciate that expansion uh, to, to not just our district, but you know, to the country, right? Just to give that case study. Um, I do have one question because I hear it all the time from parents that because of the increase of breakfast opportunities, a lot of parents are very worried about the sugary cereals and the breakfast bars that are being offered. Are you able to discuss and talk about kind of the, the thought process or changes about that in the future? So breakfast items are, as you know, very limited in terms of choices. Even on our daily lives, there are limited choices. Um, and it's what we can get from vendors. We do look at nutrition labels to find uh, what our kids might like that is, um, uh, that is compliant with the nutrition guideline. But we do uh, work re very creatively to plan for how we, uh, what we offer on the breakfast menu. Um, naturally, there are a lot of breakfast items that are sugary, but we also offer other options that are safe that are less than sugar. So we try to do a, uh, find a balance of what we offer on the menu so it's not all sugary items. Um, but as, you, as Suchetta has mentioned, um, the USDA is proposing uh, a, a, a um, sugar reduction in our nutrition guideline, which will um, encourage all of the vendors to reformulate the products to have a lower sugar option. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you for no, that. I, I love the you know the fact that there's like um, the free breakfast program because you know my sixth grader she's always like lagging, causing you know her sisters to be late, but she loves getting to school early now to have breakfast and socialize with her friends. Yes. So that helps us. And too. we also have second chance breakfast. We do offer breakfast before the bell, but we also offer breakfast during recess time for those who miss breakfast in the early time. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank, great you so Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, item 20, action items, learning and development. Hello. So tonight we are asking you to review our LCAP and create public, um, allow for public comment on it. Um, I'm very excited to present this LCAP to you that has adjustments um, from students like Satvika, uh, but really uh, 500 different students participated in giving us voice and teachers, stakeholders, um, principals, site leaders. You saw that whole presentation during the LCAP committee um, study session here. And then we took your feedback and turned, in, turned it into this final product. And um, what we're sharing with you tonight has been pre-approved by the Santa Clara County Office of Education, as well as our SELPA director. And they both said that there are areas of our LCAP that they consider to be exemplars and that they'll be sharing with other districts. Thank you. Um, is there a motion to open the public hearing? 
We have to open the public hearing. We have a motion to open the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in, oh, hold on a second. Are there any public comments on this item? No public comment at this time. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Seeing none, uh, motion carries. The public hearing is now open. Um, what were we, as far as the, the major highlight of the LCFF, like the one thing that you can point to that really stands out while we're waiting for the public comment? That's so hard is what I was saying. There's just so much to be proud of um, in our district, and, and we hear that every board meeting. Uh, but the heart and soul of the work that I do is in instruction and curriculum. Um, so I think our the integration of things like Bop Ball, STEAM Showcase, uh, deeper learning assessments, that they are layering the learning opportunities for students and that they're not these siloed one-time events for them um, is I think speaks to the systemic work that we're doing thank you thank you um, the public hearing is now in a motion to close the public hearing move to Wait, um, yeah, motion to close the public hearing. We have a motion to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Seeing none, motion carries. Public hearing is now closed. Item 20B, business services. Conduct a public hearing on the district's proposed budget adoption 2023-2024, Assistant Superintendent Business Services. Yes, earlier this afternoon, staff uh, did a budget study with the board, and um, in this board agenda, we have attached uh, the 23-24 multi-year projection summary, our income statement for the, uh, each fund of the year, along with the current year estimate actual income statement. Yeah, so tonight we're asking the board to open the public hearing and uh, we will officially adopt our budget on June 27th, 2023. There are a motion to open the public hearing on the uh, district proposed budget adoption 2023-2024. Motion to open the public hearing. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, uh, I missed it again. Scott, are there any comments from the public? Oh, we have no public comment at this time. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstained? Seeing none, the public hearing is now open for the budget adoption. Wendy, thank you so much for your team's presentation earlier at the, the board study session that really um, provided a lot of framework on, on what we have to do uh, in the coming years. I just don't like sitting in silence. <laughs> <laughs> silence is golden. <laughs> How much more time? There's a lot of cupcakes in the back. <laughs> I do, my, do not like silence. I'm in a household of three young kids. There's never a moment of silence. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? Move motion to, to close the public hearing. We have a motion to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstained? Seeing none, motion carries. The Public hearing is now closed. Item C, adopt resolution 2023, encouraging the celebration of the month of June as LGBTQ Pride Month. Is there a motion? 
Make a motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Any comments from the public? I know public comment at this time. Uh, seeing none, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstained? Seeing none, uh, motion carried. The resolution is adopted. <laughs> item 21. Uh, consent items. Consent items are considered routine and will be acted upon by the board in one motion. There is no discussion on these items prior to the motion unless members of the board, staff, or public request that a specific item be tabled or removed for discussion or correction. Scott, are there any comments from the public regarding an item being removed from the consent items? Uh, no public comment at this time. Is there a motion? Or is there any request from board members to remove anything from the uh, consent items? Seeing none, is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Um, approve the consent items. Consent items, thank you. We have a motion, is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Seeing none, consent <laughs> items are now adopted. Thank you, Cabinet um, and Business Services for your hard work on the uh, consent items. 2022 uh, dates of future board meetings. I believe our last board meeting of the year will be June 23rd, June 27th. That's 27th. June 27th, um, approximately two weeks. Are there any additional announcements? Um, typically, study session uh, starts at 4 or 5 p.m., closed session 6 p.m., regular board meeting at 7 p.m. Are there any additional announcements or reminders from the board? Yes, I know. We do have the Juneteenth event, the Sunny Hills event over the weekend on 17th. So I would highly encourage everybody if they have time in their schedule to attend. Okay, thank you. Thank Juneteenth. You. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Oh, are there any announcements or reminders from uh, Cabinet? Just one. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. And, uh, and all the work that we do supporting each other. So thank you. Absolutely. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Uh, just one reminder, we do have to adjourn to closed session, mm -hmm. not end the meeting. Thank you for that. Um, and with that said, um, we do have to return to uh, closed session. So what for the re remaining items, uh, for those who are, who are an attendee, um, you could consider that the meeting is adjourned. But we are now uh, is there a motion to adjourn to closed session? I'll make a motion to adjourn to closed session. We have a motion to, re to uh, re adjourn to closed session. Is there a second? Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstained? Seeing none, motion carries. We are now adjourned to closed session.
In closed session, board took no action. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye.